One group of veterans we all owe a great debt to are those who served during the Troubles in Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hundreds were killed. Thousands were maimed by both Republican and so-called Loyalist bombs. Many of those veterans now in the autumn of their lives. And yet you're proposing to repeal the Northern Ireland Legacy Bill, which, would which was designed in part to protect them from endless investigation and reinvestigation. Why, sir, are you throwing those veterans to the wolves to pander to Sinn Féin? Can, can, can I just say, the other member's been here for a long time. You is not me. I don't want it to be me. Please, Prime Minister. I'm not. Yeah. And that was a rather abrupt end uh, to Prime Minister's questions, as there is going to be a handover. You can see now Nusrat Ghani in the Speaker's chair. Uh, she is one of the Deputy Speakers, and she presides over the budget, the delivery of those finance uh, measures that are coming from Rachel Reeve shortly, the Chancellor. And as is tradition, she will be there throughout all of the debate afterwards. Well, while that continues and while we await for Rachel Reeves uh, to stand up. Uh, let me welcome back uh, my colleagues Chris Mason and Faisal Islam. What was striking about that Prime Minister's questions was it was really all about Rishi Sunak, wasn't it, Chris? It was, and it's a reminder of the humans at the heart of politics, yeah. that, that it is possible. We've seen it a few times since the general election uh, for people who are implacably opposed on so much politically to just have a public exchange where they acknowledge their kind of common humanity and that they're both doing, one of them's doing a job that the other one did. Uh, it's quite striking, actually. The Conservatives have said before that Rishi Sunak was going to focus on things that were close to his heart. What was there? <laughs> Yorkshire. Yes. Uh, cricket. Yes. Uh, Northern Ireland. And there's one other thing, actually. I can't remember what the other thing was. No, but uh, as you say, they were all his sort of personal passions, if you like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then that collective sense, uh, uh, that, that moment marked, if you like, of, of having a minority ethnic British Prime Minister. Well, indeed, and your reflections um, on that too, because, of course, Rishi Sunak always used to say what's great about it is that it's not really noticed. Yes, or... I remember being outside number 10 when it happened in my job as economics editor. Mm. And almost like, w w should we mention this? Should we mention this? It's okay to mention it, right? Yeah. It's okay to mention it. Because it, it was a moment. Of course. But I also think what you saw reflected in PMQs is across the House, there's a lot of respect for his work as Chancellor, especially during the well, pandemic. Absolutely. I have to there. say that I doubted that they turned around the furlough scheme as quickly as they did. And that has had a huge impact on millions of people. I mean, he hasn't checked out politics entirely, but <laughs> this is the uh, this is the end of frontline public service mm. for now. I guess for now, that's an interesting question. Yeah, it'll be interesting. He's still a young man, isn't he? Or... Yeah, yeah, he's, he's 44, <laughs> isn't he? It'll be interesting to see what he does next. And I think there's a broad base respect within and beyond his own party mm. that he worked blooming hard at the, at the various jobs he did. Now, people will have arguments forever, of course, about whether he did a good job. That's a separate question. And called an election earlier than uh, and most all of that, And yes. all of that, but I think there's a genuine sort of recognition that he sort of really put his sort of back into it and is seen as a seen as a decent chap. Well, because we've spoken a lot today about firsts, first Labour budget for 14 years, the first female Chancellor, and this is lasts for uh, Rishi Sunak, not leaving Parliament um, as yet, but yes, last major appearance at the dispatch box. And of course, he made the joke uh, quite rightly that he enjoyed the uh, Prime Minister's questions ahead of a budget because it wouldn't be him uh, that would be the sort of main event. But he is answering, of course, today. Yeah, and, and so he has this last moment, and there's been some argument within the... Oh, is it about to start? Here we go. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On July the 4th, the country voted for change. Yeah. This government was given a mandate to restore stability to our economy and to begin a decade of national renewal. Yeah. To fix the foundations and deliver change through responsible leadership in the national interest. That is our task, and I know that we can achieve it. My belief in Britain burns brighter than ever, and the prize on offer is immense. 
As my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, said on Monday, change must be felt. More pounds in people's pockets. An NHS that is there when you need it. An economy, an economy that is growing, creating wealth and opportunity for all. Because that is the only way to improve living standards. And the only way to drive economic growth is to invest, invest, invest. There are no shortcuts. And to deliver that investment, we must restore economic stability and turn the page on the last 14 years. This is not the first time that it has fallen to the Labour Party to rebuild Britain. In 1945, it was the Labour Party that rebuilt our country from the rubble of the Second World War. In 1964, it was the Labour Party that rebuilt Britain with the white heat of technology. And in 1997, it was the Labour Party that rebuilt our schools and hospitals. Today, it falls to this Labour Party, to this Labour Government to rebuild Britain once again. And while this is the first budget in more than 14 years to be delivered by a Labour Chancellor, it is the first budget in our country's history to be delivered by a woman. I am deeply proud to be Britain's first ever female Chancellor of the Exchequer. To girls and young women everywhere, I say, let there be no ceiling on your ambition, your hopes and your dreams. And along with the pride that I feel standing here today, there is also a responsibility to pass on a fairer society and a stronger generation to the next generation of women. Madam Deputy Speaker, the party opposite failed our country. Yeah. Their austerity broke our National Health Service. Yeah. Their Brexit deal harmed British businesses. Yeah. And their mini budget left families paying the price with higher mortgages. The British people have inherited their failure a black hole in the public finances public services on their knees, a decade of low growth and the worst parliament on record for living standards. Let me begin with the public finances. In July, I exposed a £22 billion black hole at the heart of the previous government's plans. A series of promises that they made but had no money to deliver, covered up from the British people, covered up from this House. The Treasury's reserve, set aside for genuine emergencies, spent three times over just three months into the financial year. Today, on top of the detailed document that I have provided to the House in July, the Government is publishing a line-by-line -line breakdown of the £22 billion black hole that we inherited. It shows hundreds of unfunded pressures on the public finances this year and into the future too. The Office for Budget Responsibility have published their own review of the circumstances around the spring budget forecast. They say that the previous government, and I quote, did not provide the OBR with all the information to them. Known about these undisclosed pressures that have since come to light, then their spring budget forecast for spending would have been, and I quote again, materially different. <laughs> Let me be clear that means any comparison between today's forecast and the OBR's March forecast is false. 
because the party opposite hid the reality of their public spending plans. Yet, at the very same budget, they made another £10 billion worth of cuts to national insurance. It was the height of irresponsibility, and they knew it, because they had run out of road and they called an election to avoid making difficult choices. So let me make this promise to the British people. Never again will we allow a government to play fast and loose with our public finances. And never again will we allow a government to hide the true state of our public finances from our independent forecaster. That's why today I can confirm that we will implement in full the ten recommendations from the Independent Office for Budget Responsibilities Review. But the country has inherited not just broken public finances, but broken public services too. The British people can see and they can feel that in their everyday lives. NHS waiting lists at record levels. Children in porter cabins as school roofs crumble. Trains that do not arrive, rivers filled with polluted waste, prisons overflowing, crimes which are not investigated and criminals who are not punished. That is the country's inheritance. That is the country's inheritance from the party opposite. But they had no plan to improve our public services. And they had no plan to put our public finances on a stable footing. Quite the opposite. Since 2021, there have been no detailed plans for departmental spending set out beyond this year. And their plans relied on a baseline for spending this year, which we now know was wrong, because it did not take into account the £22 billion black hole. The previous government government also failed to budget for costs that they knew would materialise. That includes funding for vital compensation schemes for victims of two terrible injustices. I just mentioned respecting colleagues. The public are watching. They want to hear what the Chancellor has to say. I would politely suggest that honourable members listen to this, because it includes funding for vital compensation schemes for victims of two terrible injustices, the infected blood scandal and the post office horizon scandal. The Leader of the Opposition rightly made an unequivocal apology for the injustice of the infected blood scandal on behalf of the British state. But he did not budget for the costs of compensation. Today, for the very first time, we will provide specific funding to compensate those infected and those affected in full. With £11.8 billion in this budget. And I am also today setting aside £1.8 billion to compensate victims of the Post Office Horizon scandal. Yeah. Redress that is long overdue for the pain and injustice that they have suffered. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, the leadership campaign for the party opposite has now been going on for over three months. But in all that time, not one single apology for what they did to our country. Because the Conservative Party has not changed. But this is a changed Labour Party, and we will restore stability to our country once again. The scale and seriousness of the situation that we have inherited cannot be underestimated. Together, the hole in our public finances this year, which recurs every year, the compensation schemes that they did not fund, and their failure to assess the scale of the challenges facing our public services means that this budget raises taxes by £40 billion. Any Chancellor standing here today would have to face this reality. 
and any responsible Chancellor would take action. That is why today I am restoring stability to our public finances and rebuilding our public services. As a former economist at the Bank of England, I know what it means to respect our economic institutions. I want to put on thanks my rec- I want to put on record my thanks to the Governor of the Bank, Andrew Bailey, and to the Independent Monetary Policy Committee. Today I can confirm that we will maintain the MPC's target of 2% inflation, as measured by the 12-month increase in the Consumer Prices Index. <coughs> I want to thank James Bowler, the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury, and my team of officials. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would also like to thank my predecessors as Chancellor of the Exchequer for their wise counsel as I have prepared for this budget. In particular, I would like to thank the former Right Honourable Member for Spelthorne for his invaluable advice in this weekend's Ah. papers, where he concluded that his mini-budget, and I quote, wasn't perfect. (laughs) Well, for once, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think him and I are in absolute agreement. Finally, I want to thank Richard Hughes and his team at the Office for Budget Responsibility for their work in preparing today's economic and fiscal outlook. Let me now take the House through that forecast. The cost of living crisis under the last Government stretched household finances to their limit, with inflation hitting a peak of above 11 per cent. Today, the OBR say that CPI inflation will average 2.5 per cent this year, 2.6% in 2025, then 2.3% in 2026, 2.1% in 2027, 2.1% in 2028, and 2.0% in 2029. Next, I move on to economic growth. Today's budget marks an end to short-termism. So I am pleased that for the first time, the OBR have published not only five-year growth forecasts, but a detailed assessment of the growth impacts of our policies over the next decade too. And the new Charter for Budget Responsibility, which I am publishing today, confirms that this will become a permanent feature of our framework. The OBR forecast that real GDP growth will be 1.1% in 2024, 2.0% in 2025, 1.8% in 2026, 1.5% in 2027, 1.5% in 2028, and 1.6% in 2029. And the OBR are clear, this budget will permanently increase the supply capacity of the economy, boosting long-term growth. Every budget, it might sound shocking to them, but this government is boosting long-term economic growth. Every budget that I deliver will be focused on our mission to grow the economy. And underpinning that mission are the seven key pillars of our growth strategy, developed and delivered alongside business, all driven forward by our excellent Financial Secretary to the Treasury. First and most important is to restore economic stability. That is my focus today. Second. Increasing investment and building new infrastructure is vital for productivity. So we are catalyzing £70 billion of investment through our National Wealth Fund. And we are transforming our planning rules to get Britain building again. Third, to ensure that all parts of the UK can realise their potential, we are working with the devolved governments and partnering with our mayors to develop local growth plans. Fourth, To improve employment prospects and skills, we are creating Skills England, delivering our plans to make work pay and tackling economic inactivity. Fifth, we are launching our long-term modern industrial strategy and expanding opportunities for our small and medium-sized businesses to grow. Sixth, to drive innovation, we are protecting record funding for research and development to harness the full potential of the UK's science base. And finally, to maximise the growth benefits of our clean energy mission, we have confirmed key investments such as carbon capture and storage to create jobs in our industrial heartlands. Our approach is already having an impact. 
Just two weeks ago, we delivered an international investment summit, which saw businesses commit £63.5 billion of investment into our country, creating nearly 40,000 jobs across the United Kingdom. But we cannot undo 14 years of damage in one go. Economic growth will be our mission for the duration of this Parliament. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, in our manifesto, we set out the fiscal rules that would guide this Government. I am confirming those today. Our stability rule and our investment rule. The stability rule means that we will bring the current budget into balance so that we do not borrow to fund day-to-day -day spending. Yeah. We will meet this rule in 2029-30 until that becomes the third year of the forecast. From then on, we will balance the current budget in the third year of every budget held annually each autumn. That will provide a tougher, tougher constraint on day-to-day -day spending, so that difficult decisions cannot be constantly delayed or deferred. The OBR say that the current budget will be in deficit by £26.2 billion in 2025-26, and £5.2 billion in 2026-27, before moving into surplus of £10.9 billion in 2027-28, yeah. £9.3 billion pounds in 2028-29, and £9.9 billion pounds in 2029-30, <coughs> meeting our stability rule two years early. Yeah. Monthly public sector finance data show that government borrowing in the first six months of this year was already running significantly higher than the OBR's March forecast. And so the OBR confirmed today that borrowing in this financial year is now £127 billion, reflecting the inheritance left by the party opposite. The increase in the net cash requirement in 2024-25 is lower than the increase in borrowing, at £22.3 billion higher than the spring forecast. Because of the action that we are taking, borrowing falls from 4.5% of GDP this year to 2.1% of GDP by the end of the forecast. Public sector net borrowing will be £105.6 billion in 2025-26, £88.5 billion in 2026-27, £72.2 billion in 2027-28, £71.9 billion in 2028-29 and £70.6 billion in 2029-2030. Madam Deputy Speaker, before I come to tax, it is vital that we are driving efficiency and reducing wasteful spending. In July, to begin delivering and dealing with our inheritance, I made £5.5 billion of savings this year. Today, we are setting a 2% productivity, efficiency and savings target for all departments to meet next year by using technology more effectively and joining up services across government. As set out in our manifesto, I will shortly be appointing our COVID Corruption Commissioner. Yeah. Our work to uncover those companies that used a national emergency to line their own pockets, because that money, money belongs in our public services, and taxpayers want that money back. And I can confirm today that David Goldstone has been appointed as the chair of the new Office for Value for Money to help us realise the benefits from every pound of public spending. Today. I am also taking three steps to ensure that welfare spending is more sustainable. First, we inherited the last Government's plans to reform the Work Capability Assessment. We will deliver those savings as part of our fundamental reforms to the Health and Disabilities Benefits System that my Right Honourable Friend, the Work and Pension Secretary, will bring forward. Second, I can today announce a crackdown on fraud in our welfare system, often the work of criminal gangs. We will expand DWP's counter-fraud teams, using innovative new methods to prevent illegal activity and provide new legal powers to crack down on fraudsters, including direct access to bank accounts to recover debt. This package saves £4.3 billion a year by the end of the forecast. Third, the Government will shortly be publishing the Get Britain Working White Paper, tackling the root causes of inactivity with an integrated approach across health, education and welfare. Yeah. A 
and we will provide £240 million for 16 trailblazer projects targeted at those who are economically inactive and most at risk of being out of education, employment or training, to get people into work and to reduce the benefits bill. Before a government could consider any change to a tax rate or threshold, it must ensure that people pay what they already owe. So we will invest to modernise HMRC systems using the very best technology and recruit additional HMRC compliance and debt staff. We will clamp down on those umbrella companies who exploit workers, increase, increase the interest rate on unpaid tax debt to ensure that people pay on time and go after the promoters of tax avoidance schemes. These measures to reduce the tax gap raised £6.5 billion by the end of the forecast, and I want to thank the Exchequer Secretary for his outstanding work on this agenda. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I know that for working people up and down our country, family finances are stretched, and paychecks don't go as far as they once did. So today I am taking steps to support people with the cost of living. It was the Labour government that introduced the national minimum wage in 1999. It had a transformative impact on the lives of working people. As promised in our manifesto, we asked the Low Pay Commission to take account of the cost of living for the first time. I can confirm that we will accept the Low Pay Commission recommendation to increase the national living wage by 6.7% to £12.21 an hour up to £1,400 a year for a full-time worker. And for the first time, we will move towards a single adult rate phased in over time by initially increasing the national minimum wage for 18 to 20-year-olds by 16.3% 16, by 16 as recommended by the Low Pay Commission, taking it to £10 an hour. A Labour policy to protect working people being delivered by a Labour government once again. Yeah. Second, I have heard representations from colleagues across this House about the carers' allowance and the impact of the current policy on carers looking to increase the hours that they work, including from the Honourable Members for Shipley, the Honourable Member for Scarborough and Whitby, and the Right Honourable Member for Kingston and Surbiton too. Carers' Allowance currently provides up to £81.90 per week to help those with additional caring responsibilities. Today I can confirm that we are increasing the weekly earn earnings limit to the equivalent of 16 hours at the national living wage per week, the largest increase in carers' allowance since it was introduced in 1976. This means that a carer can now earn over £10,000 a year while receiving carers' allowance, allowing them to increase their hours where they want to and keep more of their money. Yeah. I am also concerned about the cliff edge in the current system and the issue of overpayments. My right honourable friend, the Work and Pensions Secretary, has announced an independent <coughs> review to look at the issue of overpayments, and we will work across this House to develop the right solutions. Third, we will provide £1 billion from next year to extend the Household Support Fund and discretionary housing payments to help those facing financial hardship with the cost of essentials. Yeah. Fourth, having heard representations from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Trussell and others to reduce the level of debt repayments that can be taken from a household's universal credit payment each month from, by re reducing it from 25% to 15% of their standard allowance. Yeah. This means that 1.2 million of the poorest households will keep more of their award each month, lifting children out of poverty, and those, and those who benefit will gain an average of £420 a year. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, our plan to make work, work pay will also protect working people. I know that the party opposite are deeply interested in our plans here. Having seen their colleagues repeatedly dismissed at short notice, I know, I know that they are worried about their future under the Right Honourable Member for North West Essex. So they should rest easy, knowing that our plan 
will protect working people from unfair dismissal. Yeah. It will safeguard them from bullying in the workplace. Yeah. And it will improve their access to paternity and maternity leave. Yeah. I hope that the new Shadow Cabinet will soon be grateful for these increased protections yeah. at work. Yeah. It is right that we protect those who have worked all their lives. In our manifesto, we promise to transfer the investment reserve fund in the mine workers' pension scheme to members. Yeah. And I have listened closely to my honourable friends for Easington, Doncaster Central, Blanau Gwent, and Eyre, Carrick, and Cumnock on this issue. Today, we are keeping our promise so that working people who powered our country receive the pay fair pension that they are owed. Yeah. Our manifesto committed to the triple lock meaning spending on the state pension is forecast to rise by over £31 billion by 2029-30 to ensure that our pensioners are protected in their retirement. This commitment means that while working age benefits will be uprated in line with CPI at 1.7 per cent, the basic and new state pension will be uprated by 4.1 per cent in 2025-26. This means that over 12 million pensioners will gain up to £470 next year, up to £275 more than if uprated by inflation. Yeah. The pension credit standard minimum guarantee will also rise by 4.1% from around £11,400 per year to around £11,850 a year for a single pensioner. While I have sought to protect working people with measures to reduce the cost of living, I have had to say, take some very difficult decisions on tax. I want to set out my approach to fuel duty. Baked into the numbers that I inherited from the previous Government is an assumption that fuel duty will rise by RPI next year and that the temporary 5p cut will be reversed. To retain the 5p cut, and to freeze fuel duty again would cost over £3 billion next year. At a time when the fiscal position is so difficult, I have to be frank with the House that this is a substantial commitment to make. I have concluded that in these difficult circumstances, while the cost of living remains high and with a backdrop of global uncertainty, increasing fuel duty next year would be the wrong choice for working people. Yeah. It would mean fuel duty rising by 7p per litre. So I have decided today to freeze fuel duty next year and I will maintain the existing 5p cut for another year too. There will be no higher taxes at the petrol there will be no higher taxes at the petrol pumps next year. Madam Deputy Speaker. The last Government made cuts of £20 billion to employees and self-employed national insurance in their final two budgets. These tax cuts were not honest, because we now know that they were based on a forecast which the OBR say would have been materially different. It would have been materially different had they known the true extent of the last Government's cover-up. Since July, I have been urged on multiple occasions to reconsider these cuts, to increase the taxes that working people pay and see in their payslips. But I have made an important choice today, to keep every single commitment that we made on tax in our manifesto. Yeah. So I say to working people, I will not increase your national insurance, I will not increase your VAT, and I will not increase your income tax. Yeah. Working people will not see higher taxes in their payslips as a result of the choices that I am making today. Yeah. That is a promise made and a promise fulfilled. Yeah. But any responsible Chancellor would need to make difficult decisions today to raise the revenues required to fund our public services and to restore economic stability. So in today's budget, I am announcing an increase in employers' national insurance contributions. We will increase the rate of employers' national insurance by 1.2 percentage points to 15% from April 2025. 
and we will reduce the secondary threshold, the level at which employers start paying national insurance on each employee's salary from £9,100 a year to £5,000. This will raise £25 billion per year by the end of the forecast period. I know that this is a difficult choice. I do not take this decision lightly. We are asking businesses to contribute more, and I know that there will be impacts of this measure felt beyond businesses too, as the OBR has set out today. But in the circumstances... Our constituents are watching. They need to be able to hear the Chancellor. Simmer, simmer down. Chancellor. But in the circumstances that I have inherited, it is the right choice to make. Successful businesses depend on successful schools. Healthy businesses depend on a healthy NHS. And a strong economy depends on strong public finances. If the party opposite chooses to oppose this choice, then they are choosing more austerity, more chaos, more instability. This is the choice that our country faces too. As I make this choice, I know it is particularly important to protect our smallest companies. So having heard representations from the Federation of Small Businesses and others, I am today increasing the employment allowance from £5,000 to £10,500. This means 865,000 employers won't pay any national insurance at all next year. And over, and over one million will pay the same or less than they did previously. This will allow a small business to employ the equivalent of four full-time workers on the national living wage without paying any national insurance on their wages. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me now come to capital gains tax. We need to drive growth, promote entrepreneurship and support wealth creation, while raising the revenue required to fund our public services and restore our public finances. Today, we will increase the lower rate of capital gains tax from 10 to 18 per cent, and the higher rate from 20 to 24 per cent, while maintaining the rates of capital gains tax on residential property at 18 and 24 per cent too. This means the UK will still have the lowest capital gains tax rate of any European G7 economy. Alongside these changes to the headline rates of capital gains tax, we are maintaining the lifetime limit for business asset disposal relief at £1 million to encourage entrepreneurs to invest in their businesses. Yeah. Business asset disposal relief will remain at 10% this year before rising to 14% in April 2025 and to 18% from 2026-27, maintaining a significant gap compared to the higher rate of capital gains tax. Together, the OBR say that these measures will raise £2.5 billion by the end of the forecast. In a sign of this Government's commitment to supporting growth and entrepreneurship, we have already extended the Enterprise Investment Scheme and the Venture Capital Trust Schemes to 2035, and we will continue to work with leading entrepreneurs and venture capital firms to ensure that our policies support a positive environment for entrepreneurship in the UK. Next, inheritance tax. Only 6% of estates will pay inheritance tax this year. I understand the strongly held desire to pass down savings to children and grandchildren, so I am taking a balanced approach in my package today. First, the previous government froze inheritance tax thresholds until 2028. I will extend that freeze for a further two years until 2030. That means the first £325,000 of any estate can be inherited tax-free, rising to £500,000 if the estate includes a residence passed to direct descendants, and £1 million when a tax-free allowance is passed to a surviving spouse or civil partner. Second, we will close the loophole created by the previous government 
made even bigger when the lifetime allowance was abolished by bringing inherited pensions into inheritance tax from April 2027. Finally, we will reform agricultural property relief and business property relief. From April 2026, the first £1 million of combined business and agricultural assets will continue to attract no inheritance tax at all. But for assets, but for assets over £1 million, inheritance tax will apply with a 50% relief at an effective rate of 20%. This will ensure that we continue to protect small family farms and three quarters with three quarters of claims unaffected by these changes. I can also announce that we will apply a 50% relief in all circumstances on inheritance tax for shares on the alternative investment market and other similar markets, setting the effective rate of tax at 20%. Taken together, these measures raise over £2 billion by the final year of the forecast. Next, I can confirm that the Government will renew the tobacco duty escalator for the remainder of this Parliament at RPI plus 2%. Increase duty by a further 10% on hand-rolling tobacco this year. Introduce a flat rate duty on all vaping liquid from October 2026 alongside an additional one-off increase in tobacco duty to maintain the incentive to give up smoking. Yeah. And we will increase the soft drinks industry levy to account for inflation since it was introduced, as well as increasing the duty in line with CPI each year going forward. These measures will raise nearly £1 billion per year by the end of the forecast period. Madam Deputy Speaker, we want to support the take-up of electric vehicles. So I will maintain the incentives for electric vehicles in company car tax from 2028 and increase the differential between fully electric and other vehicles in the first year rates of vehicle excise duty from April 2025. These measures will raise around £400 million by the end of the forecast period. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me update the House on our plans for air passenger duty. And I can see the right honourable gentleman's ears have pricked up. <laughs> air passenger duty. Air passenger duty has not kept up with inflation in recent years. So we are introducing an adjustment, meaning an increase of no more than two pounds for an economy class short haul flight. But I am taking a different approach when it comes to private jets. <laughs> increase The rates, increasing the rate of air passenger duty by a further 50 per cent. That is equivalent to £450 per passenger for a private jet to, say, California? <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, let us now turn to our high street businesses. I know for them a major source of concern is business rates. From 2026-27, we intend to introduce two permanently lower tax rates for retail, hospitality and leisure properties, which make up the backbone of our high streets across the country. And it is our intention that it is paid for by a higher multiplier for the most valuable properties. But the previous government created a cliff edge next year as temporary reliefs end. So I will today provide 40% relief on business rates for the retail, hospitality and leisure industry in 2025-26, up to a cap of £110,000 per business. Alongside this, the small business tax multiplier will be frozen next year. Next, I can confirm that alcohol duty rates on non-draft products will increase in line with RPI from February next year. But nearly two-thirds of alcoholic drinks sold in pubs are served on draft. So today, instead of uprating these products in line with inflation, I am cutting draft duty by 1.7 per cent. Which means a penny off the pints in the pub. Alongside the changes I am making today, I am publishing a corporate tax roadmap, providing the business certainty called for by the CBI, the British Chambers of Commerce, 
and the Institute for Directors. This confirms our commitment to cap the rate of corporation tax at 25 per cent, the lowest in the G7 for the duration of this Parliament, while maintaining full expensing and the £1 million annual investment allowance, and keeping the current rates of research and development relief to drive innovation. Madam Deputy Speaker, in our manifesto, we made a number of commitments to raise funding for our public services. First, I have always said that if you make Britain your home, you should pay your taxes here too. So today I can confirm we will abolish the non-DOM tax regime. And we will remove the outdated concept of domicile from the tax system from April 2025. We will introduce a new residence-based scheme with internationally competitive arrangements for those coming to the UK on a temporary basis, while closing the loopholes in the scheme designed by the party opposite. To further encourage investment into the UK, we will also extend the temporary repatriation relief to three years and expand its scope, bringing billions of pounds of new funds into Britain. The Independent Office for Budget Responsibility say that this package of measures will raise £12.7 billion over the next five years. Next, the fund management industry provides a vital contribution to our economy. But as our manifesto set out, there needs to be a fairer approach to the way that carried interest is taxed. So we will increase the capital gains rates on carried interest to 32% from April 2025. And from April 2026, we will deliver further reform to ensure that the specific rules for carried interest are simpler, fairer and better targeted. In our manifesto, we committed to reforming stamp duty land tax to raise revenues while supporting those buying their first home. We are increasing the stamp duty land tax surcharge for second homes, known as the higher rate for additional dwellings, by two percentage points to five per cent which will come into effect from tomorrow. This will support over 130,000 additional transactions from people buying their first home or moving home over the next five years. Next, we are committed to reform the energy profits levy on oil and gas companies. I can confirm today that we will increase the rate of the levy to 38%, which will now expire in March 2030 and we will remove the 29% investment allowance to ensure that the oil and gas industry can protect jobs and support our energy security. So we will maintain the 100% first year allowances and the decarbonisation allowances too. Finally, 94% of children in the UK attend state schools provide the highest quality of support and teaching that they deserve, we will introduce VAT on private school fees from January 2025, and we will shortly introduce legislation to remove their business rates relief from April 2025 too. We said in our manifesto that these changes, alongside our measures to tackle tax avoidance, would bring in £8.5 billion in the final year of the forecast. I can confirm today that they will in fact raise over £9 billion to support our public services and, and restore our public finances. That is a promise made and a promise fulfilled. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have one final decision to take on tax today. The previous government froze income tax and national insurance thresholds in 2021, and then they did so again after the mini-budget. Extending their threshold freeze for a further two years raises billions of pounds, money to deal with the black hole in our public finances and repair our public services. Having considered this issue closely, I have come to the conclusion that extending the threshold freeze would hurt working people. It would take more money out of their pay slips. I'm keeping every single promise on tax that I made in our manifesto. So there will be no extension of the freeze in income tax and national insurance thresholds beyond the decisions by the previous government.
From 2028 to 29, personal tax thresholds will be uprated in line with inflation once again. When it comes to choices on tax, this government chooses to protect working people every single time. Madam Deputy Speaker, these are the choices I have made to restore economic stability and to protect working people. The next choice I make is to begin to repair our public services. In recent months, we have conducted the first phase of the spending review to set departmental budgets for 2024-25 and 2025-26. And I want to thank my right honourable friend, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, for his tireless work with colleagues from across government. Because I have taken difficult decisions on tax today, I am able to provide an injection of immediate funding over the next two years to stabilise and to support our public services. Uh The next phase of the spending review will report in late spring, and I have set the overall envelope today. Day-to-day spending from 2024-25 onwards will grow by 1.5% in real terms. And today, departmental spending, including capital spending, will grow by 1.7% in real terms. At the election, we promised there would be no return to austerity. Today, we deliver on that promise. But given the scale of the challenge that we are facing in our public services, that means there will still be difficult choices in the next phase of the spending review. Just as we cannot tax and spend our way to prosperity, nor can we simply spend our way to better public services. So we will deliver a new approach to public service reform, using technology to improve public services and taking a zero-based approach so that taxpayers' money is spent as effectively as possible and so we focus on delivering our key priorities. In the first phase of the spending review, I have prioritised day-to-day funding to deliver on our manifesto commitments. I want every child to have the very best start in life and the best possible start to the school day too. And I know my right honourable friend, the Education Secretary, shares my ambition. So I am today tripling investment in breakfast clubs to fund them in thousands of schools. I am increasing the core schools budget by £2.3 billion next year to support our pledge to hire thousands more teachers into key subjects. So that our young people can develop the skills that they need for the future, I am providing an additional £300 million for further education. And finally, this government is committed to reforming special educational needs provision to improve outcomes for our most vulnerable children and to ensure that the system is financially sustainable. To support that work, I am today providing a £1 billion uplift in funding, a 6% real terms increase from this year. There is no more important job for government than to keep our country safe, and we are conducting a strategic defence review to be published next year. And as set out in our manifesto, we will set a path to spending 2.5% of GDP on defence at a future fiscal event. Today, I am announcing a total increase to the Ministry of Defence's budget of £2.9 billion next year, ensuring that the UK comfortably exceeds our NATO commitments and providing guaranteed military support to Ukraine of £3 billion per year for as long as it takes. Last week, alongside my right honourable friend, the Defence Secretary, I announced in addition to this further support to Ukraine on top of our NATO commitment through our £2.26 billion contribution to the G7's Extraordinary Revenue Acceleration Agreement, repaid using profits from immobilised Russian sovereign assets. And as we approach Remembrance Sunday, it is vital that we take time to remember those who have served our country so bravely. So I am today announcing funding to commemorate the 80th anniversary of VE and VJ Day next year, to honour those who have served at home and abroad. We must also remember those 
who experienced the atrocities of the Nazi regime firsthand. I would like to pay tribute to Lily Ebert, the Holocaust survivor and educator who passed away aged 100 earlier this month. I am today committing a further £2 million to Holocaust education next year so that charities like the Holocaust Educational Trust can continue their work to ensure that these vital testimonies are not lost and are preserved for the future. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, to repair our public services, we also need to work alongside our mayors and local leaders. We will deliver a significant real terms funding increase for local governments next year, yeah. including £1.3 billion of additional grant funding to deliver essential services with at least £600 million in grant funding for social care and £230 million to tackle homelessness and rough sleeping. We are today confirming that Greater Manchester and the West Midlands will be the first mayoral authorities to receive integrated settlements from next year, giving mayors meaningful control of the funding for their local areas. And to support our high streets, we are taking action to deal with the sharp rise in shoplifting that we have seen in recent years. We will scrap the effective immunity for low-value shoplifting introduced by the party officers. And having listened closely to organisations like the British Retail Consortium and the trade union USDOR, I am providing additional funding to crack down on the organised gangs which target retailers and to provide more training to our police officers and retailers to stop shoplifting in its tracks. Finally, I am today providing funding to support public services and drive growth across Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Having discussed the matter with the First Minister of Wales, Eleanor Morgan, and my honourable friends for Clenethley and Pontypridd, I am today providing £25 million to the Welsh Government next year for the maintenance of coal tips to ensure that we keep our communities safe. Yeah. And to support growth, including in our rural areas, we will proceed with city and growth deals in Northern Ireland, in Causeway Coast and Glens, and the Mid South West. And we will drive growth in Scotland, a key priority for Scottish Labour and our leader, Anna Sawa, yeah. including with a city and growth deal in Argyll and Butte. This budget provides the devolved governments with the largest real terms funding settlements since devolution, yeah. delivering an additional £3.4 billion to the Scottish Government through the Barnet formula. Yeah. Funding funding which must now be used effectively in Scotland yeah. to deliver the public services that the people of Scotland deserve. Yeah. This budget also provides £1.7 billion to the Welsh Government and £1.5 billion to the Northern Ireland Executive in 2025-26. I said that there would be no return to austerity, and that is the choice that I have made today. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, to rebuild our country, we need to increase investment. The UK lags behind every other G7 country when it comes to business investment as a share of our economy. That matters. It means the UK has fallen behind in the race for new jobs, new industries and new technology. By restoring economic stability, and by establishing the National Wealth Fund to catalyse private funding, we have begun to create the conditions that businesses need to invest. But there is also a significant role for public investment. For too long, we have seen Conservative chancellors cut investment and raid capital budgets to plug gaps in day-to-day -day spending. The result is clear for all to see. Hospitals without the equipment they need School buildings not fit for our children. Yeah. A desperate lack of affordable housing. Yeah. Economic growth held back at every turn. Yeah. Under the plans I inherited, public investment was set to fall from 2.5% to 1.7% of GDP. But in Washington last week, the International Monetary Fund were clear. 
more public investment is badly needed in the UK. So have and listened to the case made by the former Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, former Treasury Minister Jim O'Neill, and the former Cabinet Secretary Gus O'Donnell, among others, I am confirming our investment rule. As set out in our manifesto, we will target debt falling as a share of the economy. Debt will be defined as public sector net financial liabilities, or net financial debt for short, a metric that has been measured by the Office for National Statistics since 2016 and forecast by the Office of Budget Responsibility since that date too. Net financial debt recognises that government investment delivers returns for taxpayers. Yeah. By counting not just the liabilities on a government's balance sheet, but the financial assets too. Yeah. This means that we count the benefits of that investment, not just the costs. Yep. And we free up our institutions to invest, just as they do in Germany, France and Japan. Yeah. Like our stability rule, our investment rule will apply in 2029-2030, until that becomes the third year of the forecast. From that point onwards, net financial debt will fall in the third year of every forecast. Today, the OBR say that we are already meeting our target two years early, with net financial debt falling by 2027-28, with £15.7 billion of headroom in the final year. So that we drive the right incentives in government investments, we will introduce four key guardrails to ensure capital spending is good value for money and drives growth in our economy. First, our portfolio of new financial investments will be delivered by expert bodies like the National Wealth Fund, which must by default earn a rate of return at least as large as that on gilts. Second, we will strengthen the role of institutions to improve infrastructure delivery. Third, we will improve certainty, setting capital budgets for five years and extending them at every spending review every two years. Finally, we will ensure that there is greater transparency for capital spending, with robust annual reporting of financial investments based on accounts audited by the National Audit Office and made available to the Office for Budget Responsibility at every forecast. Yeah. Taken together with our stability rule, these fiscal rules will ensure that our public finances are on a firm footing while enabling us to invest prudently alongside business. The capital plans that I now set out to drive growth across our country and repair the fabric of our nation are only possible because of our investment rule. Let me set out those investment plans. Today, we are confirming our plans to capitalise the National Wealth Fund to invest in the industries of the future, from gigafactories to ports to green hydrogen. Building on these investments, my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, is driving forward our modern industrial strategy. Yeah. Working with businesses and organisations like Make UK to set out the sectors with the biggest growth potential. Today, we are confirming multi year funding commitments for these areas of our economy, including nearly £1 billion for the aerospace sector to fund vital research and development, building on our industry in the East Midlands, the South West, and in Scotland. Over £2 billion for the automotive sector to support our electric vehicle industry and develop our manufacturing base, building on our strengths in the North East and the West Midlands, and up to £520 million for a new Life Sciences Innovative Manufacturing Fund. For our world-leading creative industries, we will legislate to provide additional tax relief for visual effect costs in TV and film. And we are providing £25 million for the North East Combined Authority, which they plan to use to remediate the Crown Works studio site in Sunderland, creating 8,000 new jobs. Yeah. To unlock these growth industries of the future, we will protect government investment in research and development with more than £20 billion worth of funding. This includes at least £6.1 billion to protect core research funding 
for areas like engineering, biotechnology and medical science. Yeah. Through Research England, other research councils and the National Academies. We will extend the Innovation Accelerators programme in Glasgow, in Manchester and in the West Midlands. And with over £500 million of funding next year, my right honourable friend, the Science, Technology and Innovation Secretary, will continue to drive progress in improving reliable, fast broadband and mobile coverage across our country, including in rural areas. Yeah. We committed in our manifesto to build 1.5 million homes over the course of this Parliament. Yeah. And my right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, is driving that work forward across government. Today I am providing over £5 billion of government investment to deliver our plans on housing next year. Yeah. We will increase the Affordable Homes programme to £3.1 billion, delivering thousands of new homes. Yeah. We will provide £3 billion worth of support in guarantees to boost the supply of homes and support our small house builders. Yeah. And we will provide investment to renovate sites across our country, including at Liverpool Central Docks, where we will deliver 2,000 new homes, and funding to help Cambridge realise its full growth potential. Yeah. Alongside this investment, we will put the right policies in place to increase the supply of affordable housing. Yeah. Having heard representations from local authorities, social housing providers and from shelter, I can today confirm that the government will reduce right to buy discounts and local authorities will be able to retain the full receipts from any yeah. sale of social housing so that we can reinvest them back into the housing stock and into new supply. By doing this, we will give more people a safe, secure and affordable place to live. Yeah. We will provide stability to social housing providers with a social housing rent settlement of CPI plus 1% for the next five years. Yeah. And we will deliver on our manifesto commitment to hire hundreds of new planning officers to get Britain building again. Yeah. We will also make progress on our commitment to accelerate the remediation of homes following the findings of the Grenfell Inquiry, with £1 billion of investment to remove dangerous cladding next year. The last government made a number of promises on transport, but it failed to fund them. Working with my right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, I am changing that. Yeah. We are today securing the delivery of the Trans Pennine upgrade to connect York, Leeds, Huddersfield and Manchester. Yeah. Delivering fully electric local and regional services between Manchester and Staley Bridge by the end of this year. Yeah. With a further electrification of services between Church Fenton and York by 2026 to help grow our economy across the north of England with faster and more reliable services. Yeah. We will deliver East-West Rail to drive growth between Oxford, Milton Keynes and Cambridge, yeah. with the first services running between Oxford, Bletchley and Milton Keynes next year, yeah. and trains between Oxford and Bedford running from 2030. We are delivering railway schemes which improve journeys for people across our country, including upgrades at Bradford Forster Square station, improving capacity at Manchester Victoria and electrifying the Wigan to Bolton line. Yeah. My right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, has also set out a plan for how to get a grip of HS2. Yeah. Today, we are securing delivery of the project between Old Oak Common and Birmingham and we are committing the funding required to begin tunnelling work to London Euston Station. Yeah. This will catalyse private investment into the local area, delivering jobs and growth. Yep. I am also funding significant improvements to our roads network. For too long, potholes have been an all too visible reminder of our failure to invest as a nation. 
Today, that changes. With £500 million increase in road maintenance budgets next year, more than delivering on our manifesto commitment to fix an additional one million potholes each year. We will provide over £650 million of local transport funding to improve connections across our country, in towns like Crewe and Grimsby, and in our villages and rural areas from Cornwall to Cumbria. And while the previous government's policy was for the bus fare cap to end this December, we understand how important bus services are for our communities. And so we will extend the cap for a further year, setting it at £3 until December 2025. Finally, we will deliver £1.3 billion of funding to improve connectivity in our city regions. Funding projects like the Briley Hill Metro extension in the West Midlands, the renewal of Sheffield Super Tram, and the West Yorkshire Mass, tra- mass Transit, including in Bradford and Leeds. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, to bring new jobs to Britain and to drive growth across our country, we are delivering our mission to make Britain a clean energy superpower, yeah. led by my right honourable friend, the Energy Secretary. Earlier this month, we announced a significant multi-year investment between government and business into carbon capture and storage, creating 4,000 jobs across Merseyside and Teesside. Today, I am providing funding for 11 new green hydrogen projects across England, Scotland and Wales. They will be amongst the first commercial scale projects anywhere in the world, including in Bridgend, East Renfrewshire and Barrow in Furness. We are kick-starting the Warm Homes Plan by confirming an initial £3.4 billion over the next three years to transform 350,000 homes, including a quarter of a million low-income and social homes. And we will establish GB Energy providing funding next year to set up GB Energy at its new home in Aberdeen. Overall, we will invest an additional overall, we will invest an additional 100 billion pounds over the next 5 years in capital spending, only possible because of our investment rule. The OBR say today that this investment will drive growth across our country in the next five years and, in the longer term, increase GDP by up to 1.4%. It will crowd in private investment, meaning more jobs and more opportunities in every corner of the UK. That is the choice that I have made – to invest in our country and to grow our economy. Today, I am setting out two final areas in which investment is so badly needed to repair the fabric of our nation. Madam Deputy Speaker, my right honourable friend, the member for Lewisham West and East Dulwich and I, joined the Labour Party because of the condition of our schools in the 1980s and the 1990s under Conservative governments. When we were at secondary school, my sixth form was a couple of prefab huts in the playground. My school, like so many others, was rebuilt by the last Labour government. Yeah. But today, after 14 years of Tory government, progress has gone backwards. Yeah. School, roofs. school roofs are crumbling and millions of children are facing the same back- backdrop as I did. I will be the Chancellor that changes that. So today, I am providing £6.7 billion of capital investment to the Department for Education next year, a 19% real terms increase on this year. That includes £1.4 billion to rebuild over 500 schools in the greatest need, including St Helens Primary School in Hartlepool and Mercia Academy in Derby, and so many more across our country. 
and we will provide £2.1 billion more to improve school maintenance, £300 million more than this year, ensuring that all our children can learn somewhere safe, including dealing with rack-affected schools. In the constituencies of my right hon. Friends for Watford, Stourbridge, Hindburn and beyond. Yeah. Alongside investment in new teachers and funding through thousands of new breakfast clubs, this Government is giving our children and young people the opportunities that they deserve. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I come to our most cherished public service of all, our NHS. Yeah. My right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary, is beginning to repair the damage of the last 14 years. Yes. In our first week in office, he commissioned an independent report into the state of our health service by Lord Darcy. Its conclusions were damning. While our NHS staff do a remarkable job, and we thank them for it, it is clear that in so many areas, they are moving in the wrong direction. Yeah. 100,000 infants waited over six hours in A&E last year. 350,000 people are waiting a year for mental health support. Cancer deaths here higher than in other countries. It is simply unforgivable. In the spring, we will publish a 10-year plan for the NHS to deliver a shift from hospital to community from analogue to digital, yeah. and from sickness to prevention. Yeah. Today, we are announcing a down payment on that plan to enable the NHS to deliver 2% productivity growth next year. These reforms are vital, but we should be honest. The state of the NHS that we have inherited after, and I quote Lord Darcy, the most austere decade since the NHS was founded. Yeah. Reform, reform must come alongside investments. So today, because of the difficult decisions that I have taken on tax, welfare and spending, I can announce that I am providing a £22.6 billion increase in the day-to-day -day health budget and a, and a £3.1 billion increase in the capital budget over this year and next. Yeah. This is the largest real terms growth in day to day NHS spending outside of COVID since 2010. Yeah. Let me set out what this funding is delivering. Many NHS buildings have been left in a state of disrepair. So we will provide £1 billion of health capital investment next year to address the backlog of repairs and upgrades across our NHS. To increase capacity for tens of thousands more procedures next year, we will provide a further £1.5 billion for new beds in hospitals across our country, new capacity for over a million additional diagnostic tests and new surgical hubs and diagnostic centres so that people waiting for their treatment can get it as quickly as possible. My right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary, will be setting out further details of his review into the new hospital programme in the coming weeks and publishing in the new year. But I can tell the House today that work will continue at pace to deliver those seven hospitals affected by the RAC crisis, yeah. including West Suffolk Hospital in Bury St Edmunds and Leighton Hospital in Crewe. Yeah. And finally, because of this record injection of funding, because of the thousands of additional beds that we have secured, and because of the reforms that we are delivering in our NHS, we can now begin to bring waiting lists down more quickly and move towards our target for waiting times to be no longer than 18 weeks. Yeah. By delivering on our manifesto commitment for 40,000 extra hospital appointments a week, that is the difference that this Labour government is making. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, the choices I have made today are the right choices for our country. Yeah. To restore stability, 
to our public finances, yes. to protect working people, yes. to fix our NHS, yes. and to rebuild Britain. Yes. That doesn't mean these choices are easy, but they are responsible. Yeah. If the party opposite disagrees with the choices that I have made, yeah. then they must answer. What choices would they make? Yeah. Would they again? Would they again choose the path of irresponsibility, the path taken by Liz Truss, and ignore the problems in our public finances altogether? If that is their choice, they should say so. But let me be clear. If they disagree with my choices on tax, then they would not be able to protect working people. If they disagree with our plans to fund public services, then they would have to cut schools and hospitals. And if they disagree with our investment rule, then they would have to delay or cancel thousands of projects which drive growth across our country. This is, a this is a moment of fundamental choice for Britain. I have made my choices, the responsible choices, to restore stability to our country, to protect working people, more teachers in our schools, more appointments in our NHS, more homes being built, fixing the foundations of our economy, yeah. investing in our future, delivering change, rebuilding Britain. Yeah. We on these benches commend those choices, and I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Rachel Reeves, the Chancellor, sitting down next to the Prime Minister, who is congratulating her after what was a commanding performance in the House of Commons. And the time that they have spent putting this budget together, it lived up, certainly, to its billing of being a big consequential budget at the very heart of it, which we had expected and which had really been set out by both Rachel Reeves and the Prime Minister, is, as she said very clearly, this budget raises taxes by 40 billion pounds at the upper end of what we were expecting. The bulk of that is going to come to changes to national insurance contributions, raising 25 billion pounds on NI uh, increases to employers. And we'll talk about the details in just a moment. Um, there were also announcements about income tax thresholds. We had thought that Rachel Reeves might extend those beyond 2028 29. But she said today there will be no extension of that freeze in those tax thresholds and from 2829 <laughs> they will be uprated in line with inflation. She also talked about tax rises across the board in terms of capital gains tax, in terms of inheritance tax loopholes uh, and stamp duty as well all raising in the region of £9 billion. And on public services, she said that there would be an increase in spending, but not much more than had already been earmarked, 1.5%. But broadly, she said that she had made choices to fix the foundations and she really pinned this whole budget in the hour and 20 minutes she was standing up um, to say that it was an inheritance, a dire inheritance that she had been given by the party opposite, by the Conservatives and that is why she had to make what she called these difficult choices. We'll also be looking at some of the market reaction because she talked about the change that she is making to the investment rule. But here is Rishi Sunak with his response. Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, on the day that he took office, the Prime Minister said that he wanted to restore trust to British politics with action, not words. Well, today his actions speak 
for themselves with a budget that contains broken promise after broken yeah. promise yeah. And, reveals, and reveals the simple truth that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have not been straight with the British people. Yeah. Time, time and again. Time and again, we Conservatives warned Labour would tax, borrow and spend far beyond what they were telling the country. And time and again, they denied they had such plans. But today, the truth has come out. Proof that they planned to do this all along. Because, Madam Deputy Speaker, today's budget, today's budget sees the fiscal rules fiddled, borrowing borrowing increased by billions yeah. of pounds, inflation-busting handouts for the trade unions, yeah. Yeah. Britain's poorest pensioners, British, Britain's poorest... Order! Order! Just as we respected the Chancellor and heard her speak, we were here, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker. Britain's poorest pensioners squeezed, yeah. welfare spending out of control and a spree of tax rises they promised the working people of this country they would not do. National insurance, up. Capital gains tax, up. Inheritance tax, up. Energy taxes, up. Business rates, up. First time buyer stamp duty, up. Pensions tax, up. They have fiddled the figures. The public will also want to hear what the Leader of the Opposition has to say. And shouting whilst I can see you will mean that you will not be called to speak later on. Simmer. They don't like it, but this is the truth. They have fiddled the figures. They have raised tax to record levels. They have broken their promises. And it is the working people of this country that are going to pay the price. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Chancellor and Prime Minister have tried to say that they had no choice, but be in no doubt. Their misleading claims about the state of the economy are nothing but a cynical political device. Today's situation, today's situation is a world away from the genuinely bleak in legacy that we Conservatives inherited from the last Labour government. Borrowing, the shadow to the Chancellor forgot to point out, borrowing one pound in every four that they spent. Debt rising every year and unemployment at 8%. Now, I understand the Chancellor's shameless political motivations, why it suits her, why it suits her to cook up a false justification for her agenda. But today, the OBR has in fact declined to back up her claims of a fictional £22 billion black hole. It actually appears nowhere in their report, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is deeply, deeply disappointing that she has sought to politicise the independent OBR that should be above party politics. But as she now knows, as she now knows, her playing politics has done real damage to our economy. She talked. She talked. She talked about being a Bank of England economist. Well, as the Bank of England's former chief economist has said, Labour's approach has generated fear and foreboding and uncertainty amongst consumers, businesses and investors. The rhetoric of this Chancellor and this Prime Minister damaging the British economy for political purposes. Now, you only need, you only need to look at the facts to see that the Chancellor's claims about her economic inheritance are nonsense. Labour inherited an economy with inflation back at its 2% target, mortgage rates 
mortgage rates being cut and unemployment low. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, when we left office, the United Kingdom was the fastest growing advanced economy in the world. And when it comes, and when it comes to the public finances, not once has the Chancellor acknowledged that we took the right decision to spend half a trillion pounds to protect the British people from the impact of COVID and Putin's war. And let me remind you, not only did the party opposite support all those interventions, they wanted us to go even further, Madam Deputy Speaker. And when I, when I made the tough choices to fix the public finances afterwards, the Prime Minister and Chancellor opportunistically opposed me every step of the way. So I will take no lectures from those two about difficult decisions. But because, but because of those decisions that we made, the Chancellor inherited lower borrowing than France, America, Italy and Japan, and the second lowest debt in the entire G7. So any which way you look at it, Labour's claims about their inheritance are purely ludicrous. Yes. These are her choices, yeah. so stop blaming everyone else and take responsibility yeah. for them. Now, let me, turn, let me turn to the substance of those choices. During the election, the Chancellor repeatedly promised that her plans were fully funded. Yeah. Only a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister said the budget would balance the books. But this budget does no such thing and reveals they have not been straight with the British people. Oh, come on. I can see you, even when you're hiding behind another colleague. No. <laughs> Yelling across the chamber is not on. The public and our constituents are watching. I know emotions are high, and I expect some noise, but have the confidence to shout closer, and I will definitely call you out. <laughs> Lead the position. A few weeks ago, the Prime Minister said the budget would balance the books. But this budget does no such thing and reveals that they haven't been straight with the British people. Because today, the Chancellor has launched an enormous borrowing spree, saddling our children and grandchildren with billions upon billions pounds more debt, pushing up interest rates, leaving our economy more exposed to future shocks, and, and leading the OBR today to now forecast higher inflation in every year of the forecast. And her decision to let borrowing rip make a total nonsense of her claims on the state of the public finances. Because if they truly were in such a dire strait, as she has said, what we should have seen today is a significant reduction in borrowing to repair them, not the splurge that she's just unleashed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Instead, what we see today, borrowing higher in every year of the forecast, debt higher in every year of the forecast. Now, now she has tried, she has tried to cover up that splurge by fiddling the fiscal rules. According to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the new measure will not actually even be a constraint on the amount she can borrow. And it is hard to escape the suspicion, they say, that the government is attracted to this change by the fact that it would allow for significantly more borrowing without any need for tough choices elsewhere. Indeed. Fiscal oh. fiddling is what they have called it. Oh. And the Chancellor herself actually agrees, because she specifically told the British people she wouldn't change the debt target. Because, and I quote, she said, I'm not going to fiddle the figures to get better results. But that is exactly what she has done. She has gone back on her word and fiddled the figures so that she can borrow billions more. Broken promise after broken promise, and working people will pay the price. Now, the reason the Chancellor has increased borrowing and increased taxes it's because she has totally failed to grip public spending. First, she has no meaningful plan. First, 
First, she has no meaningful plan to deliver the £20 billion worth of savings available if the public sector returned simply to its pre-pandemic levels of productivity. Instead, one of the first things the Chancellor did was to hand out inflation-busting pay rises to the unions without getting any productivity-enhancing reforms in return. The Chancellor also, the Chancellor also scrapped the Chancellor also scrapped her predecessor's plan to get the civil service back to its pre-pandemic numbers. She doesn't think to th seem to think that the civil service can be reduced by a single person. And the Chancellor has no plan to control welfare spending. Yet if we simply got working age welfare spending on people with a disability or health condition back to pre-COVID levels, that would free up 30 billion pounds worth of savings. So whether it is scrapping our plans to shrink the civil service or their failure to control welfare spending, this is not her inheritance, Madam Deputy Speaker. These are her choices. And the result, higher spending, higher borrowing, higher taxes. It's broken promise after broken promise and working people paying the price. And Madam Deputy Speaker, let me turn next to growth and remind the Prime Minister and Chancellor that they did in fact inherit the fastest growing economy in the G7. And that, that is testament to the last government boosting investment by introducing full expensing, increasing the labour supply by expanding childcare, reforming welfare and cutting tax on work. All decisions, the OBR said, would increase growth. Now, the Chancellor has said that growing the economy is the government's number one priority. The Prime Minister even said that higher growth would come very quickly. Well, to be fair, the Prime Minister and Chancellor have had a rapid impact on growth. As their plans for the economy became clear, survey after survey showed business confidence plummeting. And no wonder the government's own assessment says its French-style labour laws will impose a £5 billion... Well, they will be explaining it to the businesses in their constituency that their labour laws, by their own assessment, will impose a £5 billion direct cost on business, disproportionately hitting smaller businesses. And as business group after business group has pointed out, the tax rises on jobs and enterprise in today's budget will hobble growth. A poll tax on business is what they've called it. But despite, but despite these record-breaking tax rises, despite fiddling the figures, despite letting borrowing soar, today the OBR has forecast growth is going to be lower under this government than it was forecast to be under the Conservatives. That's the change they have wrought. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is what happens when the Labour Party is led by people who have no experience of business and enterprise. Relentlessly. Relentlessly. Relentlessly talking down our economy, delivering a tidal wave of anti-business regulations, destroying our flexible labour market and raising taxes to the highest level in our country's history. It's the classic labour agenda. Higher taxes, higher borrowing, no plan for growth and working people paying the price. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, during the election campaign, the Prime Minister specifically said there would be no tax surprises under Labour. The Chancellor went even further, saying she wanted to bring taxes down. Each time they made these promises, we warned they were not telling the truth. And today, the Chancellor and Prime Minister have done what they were always planning to do, but chose to get hidden from the British people. Far from reducing taxes, as a result of today's budget, never in the history of our country will taxes be higher than they are under this Labour government. Now, they specifically promise, they specifically promise that they wouldn't raise tax on working people. 
The Chancellor said Labour will not put up income tax, national insurance or VAT. Just this month, the Prime Minister gave, and I quote, an absolute commitment to not raising tax on working people. So what does today's budget do? It raises tax on working people by increasing national insurance and breaking Labour's promise. As the, independ in, as the Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies have said, this is a straightforward breach of their manifesto. Yeah. Because as the OBR have made clear, this tax rise is passed through entirely to working people. Even since she started speaking, the IFS have already confirmed that the vast majority of this tax increase will hit working people through lower pay. But you don't need to take it from the IFS or even the OBR. You can take it from the Chancellor herself. She has previously described her tax rise as a jobs tax, which takes money out of people's pockets. And not only that, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Chancellor also said the problem with national insurance is that it is a tax purely on people who go to work yes. and those who employ them. Yes. So far from protecting working people, she is literally raising the only major tax that exclusively hits working people. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. Businesses on the British High Street, your taxes are going up. Businesses investing in British energy, your taxes are going up. The small business owner looking to reap the rewards of years spent growing a business and creating jobs, your taxes are going up. The young couple saving to buy their first home, your taxes are going up. The family. Uh, oh, Mr. Streeting, you promised me this morning. Yeah, come on, Let's try and keep our promises. Well, I'm sure the front bench were explaining to the young couple and their constituency saving to buy their first home that their taxes are going up. To the family wanting to pass on their farm or their business to their children, your taxes are going up. The parents sacrificing to give their kids the best start in life, your taxes are going up. They're taxing your job, they're taxing your business, they're taxing your home, they're taxing your savings. I said it during the election campaign, you name it, they will tax it, and that is exactly what they have done. Broken promise after broken promise, and working people paying the price. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, from the final time from this dispatch box, let me deliver. Let me deliver some basic truths. Government can foster growth, but it can't magically conjure it up. We need businesses, workers, investors, and entrepreneurs to all back this country and build our economy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether your income comes in a pay packet from investments in dividends or profits. It is a poor politics that is so focused on what people receive that it fails to see that what matters is what people put in. Yeah. The only way to grow the economy and to create wealth is for people to put in more. So when you create a negative environment for business, when you undermine confidence in our country, when you vilify and penalise people, for doing exactly what we need them to do, which is to invest, take risks and work hard. You don't create growth, you hold back growth. And more than that, the promise of growth today does not pay the bills. The growth tomorrow does not pay the bills today. This is not the first government to peddle the borrow to grow myth, but time and again we have seen the same ending. Not higher growth, but higher debt higher inflation and higher taxes. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, whatever you think about the economic arguments around today's budget, there is a more fundamental point that I want to conclude with. The Prime Minister has talked relentlessly about trust. Yet today's budget reveals, above all, that the Labour Party... Today's budget reveals, above all, that the Labour Party did not tell the truth. Yeah. 
They said they wouldn't fiddle the figures. They have. They said they wouldn't increase borrowing. They have. They said they wouldn't raise taxes on working people. They have. Broken promise after broken promise, and it is the working people of this country that will pay the price. Rishi Sunak sitting down there, having given a very robust response to the Chancellor, Rachel Reeves. His main point, which he hammered time and again, is that Labour were not straight uh, with the British people during the election campaign, that taxes are going up, which we absolutely heard in the budget, spending is going up, and so is borrowing. He said that Rachel Reeves is fiddling the figures when it comes to borrowing, as she says, for long-term investment. Let's discuss everything that we heard first in the budget and the response from Rishi Sunak with our guests for this part of our special budget programme. Uh, delighted to say we have the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Darren Jones, and Vicky Young has joined us as the BBC's Deputy Political Editor. The BBC's Economics Editor, Faisal Islam, is still here, and we've been joined by Paul Johnson uh, from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. First of all, uh, Paul Johnson, before we get to Darren Jones, the figures were quite extraordinary in the budget uh, that Rachel Reeves outlined, particularly on the level of taxes and how much they are going to increase. What was your reaction? Well, as we expected, it's a very, very big budget. I mean, these are huge tax increases, £40 billion in the scorecard, um, and taxes as a fraction of national income reaching record levels. Um, but I think two other things are very striking. One is a big increase in borrowing, mostly to increase spending on investment, which is what the Chancellor says she wants to focus on, but not entirely for that. Also, it's part of what's paying for additional day-to-day -day public spending. But the other thing that's really striking is there's a huge increase in spending this year and next mm. uh, on day-to-day -day spending, and then it flattens off almost completely. So there's a huge gamble here, which is that there's a really big increase in day-to-day -day spending, spending on the HS this year and next. So part of the gamble is, can you spend that much that quickly, efficiently, and then not quite a return to austerity after that, but nothing, really. I mean, it basically flattens off um, after that. And if you take these numbers seriously, we would say you really struggle to see any further growth in spending for non-protected non departments. So the danger, I think, for the government is they have to come back again oh. and ask for more tax revenue or more borrowing in order to meet any further claims on spending, uh, unless, of course, they do better on growth than the OBR is forecasting. The last thing I think is very striking. What does the OBR say in here about growth? It says this budget will increase growth in the next year or two, essentially because it's increasing demand in the economy, but it will increase inflation, it will increase interest rates, and it will slow growth over the last three years of the, of the forecast period. Well, just before I come to it, your reaction to that? What happens in two years' time? You come back for more money from working people, and we'll discuss the definition in just a moment. But what do you say to what you've just heard from Paul Johnson, Darren Jones? Look, our promise at the election not to increase income tax, national insurance or VAT on working people is a promise that has been honoured today really? in this budget. Yes, very clearly. There's not been an in increase in income tax, national insurance or VAT that working people will pay. They will see that in their pay slips at the end of this month, month and every other month following. That is not just a promise for this budget, that is a promise for the whole of this parliament. So I can categorically tell you today mm. that we will not be coming back in future budgets to break that manifesto commitment. It is a commitment that lasts between the last election and the next. Can I just ask you, uh, Paul Johnson, we've just heard there from Darren Jones that this is not a breach of the manifesto going into the election. And I think we'll be able to show uh, that manifesto commitment. But when we are talking about honesty and what most people would think when they read that part of the manifesto, is this increase in employers' national insurance contributions a breach of that commitment. Here it is. Labour will not increase taxes on working people, which is why we will not increase national insurance, the basic hire or additional rates of income tax or VAT. Uh, in terms of that increase on national insurance contributions, is that in line with that manifesto? I think I'd say two things. First, if you're going to raise anything like this amount of tax, and I understand entirely why the government has done it, they had to raise one of those three taxes. Mm. So whether it's a breach or not, it was the right thing to do to do that. But you just read it out. It says we will not increase national insurance contributions. 
you have increased national insurance contributions. And it is, as Rishi Sunak says, Darren Jones, about trust. Now, whether you think you've kept to the sort of letter of what that says, um, for most people reading that, they will not have assumed that national insurance contributions will have gone up on employers, and they've gone up substantially to raise the money that you needed. And we'll put that to a side, whether it was the right thing to do. Will you now sit here and say you can understand why most people who have watched closely about what you promised in the election and what Rachel Reeves has announced now, they are two different things. She has contradicted what you said. No, and I don't accept that because if you look at the wording on that manifesto page, it's very clear that we're talking about people that go to work. People who go to work get paid a salary. They receive a pay slip. They directly pay income tax or national insurance on that pay slip. We made a promise not to increase those taxes. We have not increased those taxes today. So that is a promise that has been honoured. And I just do not accept the premise that in any way there is a breach of that commitment in the manifesto because it is plainly very clear what we promised to working people. And I think most people, having read that manifesto, know exactly what it means. All right, well, let, promise well let's, cho let's choose something else that Keir Starmer uh, said uh, before he became Prime Minister. There'll be no surprises on tax. How would you describe the announcement of £20 billion worth of tax rises on national insurance contributions by employers? There is no surprise on tax because we set out in our manifesto our promises. We said we were going to honour these commitments to workers, which we have honoured. We've set out that we're going to close the non-DOM loophole. We're going to put VAT on private schools. We're going to increase the taxes on windfall profits for the oil and gas industry and close some of the loopholes for private equity bosses. We've done all of those things. It's very clearly set out in... The manifesto. And look, right. I will accept that this is a budget that meets the scale of the challenges we face as a country. But as the Chancellor said today, you can either choose to make these choices and tackle those challenges, mm. or you can choose to continue what the Conservatives did, which was essentially to lie to the public about the state of the public finances. We are not willing to do that. And if people want to challenge our choices, mm. that's fine. But they have to set out what the alternatives would be. Well, we'll come to that. But let's just go... Sorry, yes, do. Just reading from the Office of Budget Responsibility in terms of the employer initial insurance... They, the, the OBR has significantly downgraded its expectation of household disposable income growth as a direct result, it says here, of increases in the employer's national insurance mm. being passed on to wages. So you're right, it won't appear in the pay slip, but we are arguing on the head of a pin here, aren't we? Mm. This is, you know, £40 billion of tax is paid by someone, and I think all economists would agree that nearly all of it will effectively be paid by employees. But, Paul, answer the simple question. Have we increased the rate of national insurance that workers pay on their payslip? The answer is no, isn't it? But it, that's not what it said. Well, let's uh, not get that's into the answer. That's the answer. answer. But, but, on. but the but point is, the, it's the, it, reducing it, You answer. are relying very heavily, as I say, on the letter. It won't appear in payslips. But Paul Johnson is right. Further down the line, it could result in lower wages for working people. This is not a cost free budget for working people. Before you answer it, let's just have a listen and remind ourselves what Keir Starmer said during the election campaign. All our plans are set out in the manifesto, fully costed, fully funded, and none of them, none of them, all launched yesterday, require tax increases over and above the ones we've set out. We are going to deal with a non-DOM tax status. We are going to deal with the uh, uh, private equity loophole. We are going to deal with um, the tax break for private schools and the tax that we need to introduce or, or to extend on oil and gas companies. But none of our plans require any other tax rises. No. Well, that's just not true, is it? No tax increases over and above the only two things that were stated in the manifesto and during the campaign, the VAT on private school fees um, and the closing of the non-DOM status. There'd be no other tax increases. That is straightforwardly not the case. You've just announced £40 billion pounds worth of tax rises. Maybe rightly, for the reasons you've said, but that is not consistent, let me put it that way, with what you said during the election. Joe, that's just wrong. The first part of what oh. the Prime Minister said then was that our manifesto commitments, the new things that we're going to do, which we called our first steps, were funded by the tax changes in our manifesto. That has been done today. So why have we had to increase taxes more broadly than that? Mm. 
because we found this £22 billion black hole in the public finances each and every year of the next five years. And as the Chancellor said, you've got a choice. Yeah. Are you either going to cut public services and spending by £22 billion to get a grip of that, or are you going to actually put that money into stabilising our public services so that we can get on with reform and growth? That's the choice we've taken today. Well, let's talk about growth, and then I will invite uh, my colleagues here to ask some questions too. Let's talk about growth. Growth is the number one priority. It's your number one mission. And yet, the the announcement of those tax rises on national insurance employer contributions, just as a start, there are others, capital gains tax, um, inheritance tax changes and so on. You are stifling the very machine that will create growth. Governments don't make growth, you create a climate and you've done the exact opposite. What was it in this budget that will incentivise businesses to take people on and expand? Well, there are two parts to that question. I'll take both of them. First, on growth, if you look at the Office of Budget Responsibility documents, yeah. they're very clear that we go from 1.1 to 1.6 in terms of the rate of growth over the five-year period mm -hmm. uh, with a bump at the start of the first five years. That means that the economy is growing, and if you look backwards, it's growing better than it does over the past few years. So the economy is growing over the forecast period. Do we want more growth? Absolutely. Well, you'll need it. Uh, well, I want it. We recognise that as well as the need to reform our public services. But you can't just achieve that in one budget. That is the hard yards we have to now work on over the years ahead. But and this yet, budget all has the a down payment you've on that growth. All the policies you've announced are about putting a burden on business, no, the engine of growth. That's not true. Well, it is. If you look at the investment in our industrial set strategy for key sectors in the economy, money for aerospace and automotive and electric vehicles, a commitment to keep our research and development funding ahead of the pack in terms of uh, uh, the history here in this country in comparison to other countries, if you look at the 10-year infrastructure strategy, if you look at the investment in transport and housing, which enables city-city regions to grow because it meets the needs of expanding populations, there are enormous numbers of policies in this budget that are good for growth uh, in Britain, but it will take some time to be delivered, and that has been recognised by the OBR in the numbers today. Faisal. Joe, I mean, this is obviously a mammoth budget. I mean, just mm. to just be clear to the viewers about the scale of change, 70 billion a year in extra spending, 2% of the size of our economy, 1%, as we were talking about, on extra taxes, 1% on extra spending. And it takes us to sort of national highs in terms of taxes as a proportion of GDP, the size of the state fundamentally higher than the pandemic. Can you be honest about this, looking forward, that this, this, if you like, the model for the UK economy has changed. We're now more like a continental European economy with a bigger state and higher taxes. And that is what Labour will preside over and that is what you want. That's your model. Well, I just slightly challenge the premise of your question that I've not been honest so far. I've been okay. entirely honest okay. every answer <laughs> I've uh, sure. given you today. So I would just uh, uh, take that back if I were you. <laughs> but um, in terms of the second part of your question, that we recognise that we've inherited an economy, we've inherited a set of public services that not match fit. They're absolutely not match fit. Mm. We've got to invest and modernise and improve our public services so that they cost less in the future. But we've got to it's get... It's going to get out in wages, though, isn't it? But, well, look, all of these things are difficult, but that is the job we've got to do, and we've got to get growth back into the economy because that is the only sustainable route to getting a grip of public finances and delivering the right outcomes for this country. I'm the first to recognise that's a really hard job to do, especially with the inheritance that we've had from 14 years of the Conservatives. But that is what this budget does today. It chooses investment over yeah. decline. It matches the scale of the challenges we face as a country. And it is the starting gun for a decade of national renewal that we promised at the election. On the continental European model, that's what the UK under the Labour government is pursuing now. Well, we set out the fiscal rules uh, in the budget today. We want debt falling as a size of the uh, economy. We're going to have all of our day-to-day -day spending paid for by tax receipts, which we, which we will meet in 27-28 on a rolling basis. That is the trajectory of growth for this country going forward. I, I should say, despite all those numbers, and this will be better news, I think, for the Chief Secretary, the reaction in the markets is yeah. totally benign. Well, it's good. like it's like the, 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 the guilt yield has actually fallen and continued to But fall. they had risen a little bit over Beforehand, the past yes, few but, weeks. But, yeah. you know, it is rather intriguing given the, the sorts of sums I've just talked about. Well, I'm, I'm, glad, I mean, I'm, I'm glad people think it's good news because I do as well. Right. Well, there is a political risk, isn't there, uh, Vicky? If taxes are going up, spending is going up, borrowing is going up. Yes, we've seen the figures of some growth perhaps coming down the track over the next few years. That's the prediction. But it is still a big political gamble. Yeah, and I think, look, you know, Labour have made the assessment and the government now have made the access assessment that people want and are happy to see taxes go up in order to fund public services, which they felt under the last government weren't working properly uh, in all sorts of areas. Now, I think the big question might be how soon 
might people see a difference? And I think what's interesting here is that, you know, there's a lot of money there going into the NHS, £22 billion uh, extra over two years. During the election, West Streeting talked a lot about it not really being about more money. He talked about it being about reform. And yet this a huge chunk of those tax rises seem to be going towards the NHS. And I'm just interested whether you think people will start to see a change very quickly or not, and what that change might be, not just in the NHS, but elsewhere as well. Because if you know, Paul's right, the money's going in quickly and early and then tails off, how soon can those changes be seen? Sure. So in terms of our first step, so for example, on health, 40,000 additional appointments a week at hospital to clear the elective waiting list backlog, people will see that uh, immediately. That will continue to deliver through this year and into next year. And we're very, very confident about, about that. So two years? Uh, we, will make pro we will deliver our first steps, yes, within those two years, without question. There's clearly a lot more to do, but that was the first step we set out in our manifesto. Capital investment into new scanners and technology and hospital buildings and dealing with, you know, rack and, you know, that takes time to order and install and build and get off the ground. Of course it will, and that will take time to get there. But Wes is the first person to recognise uh, that he has to reform the National Health Service, not just for its own purposes, but because it is the engine of opportunity and growth in our country when so many people are off work sick and unable to be in gainful employment. So there's but isn't a it strange to put the, the money economy. in before the 10-year plan for the NHS? I mean, that's not coming till the spring, is it? And, you know, the, there was no mention much about social care. But, you know, that plan is coming and yet you're putting in billions of pounds now before we've got that so we have two problems one was this black hole in the nhs that we uh, inherited from the conservatives uh, they had tons of bills coming in with no money put aside to pay for them we've prioritized money to pay for those bills to maintain the activity uh, that the NHS is currently able to perform to get junior doctors back into the hospitals and off of uh, strikes. That's a decision that we took, yes. Uh, but actually the 10-year strategy will align with this second phase of our spending review now coming out of the budget where we'll allocate the funding that Rachel has announced today uh, over the years ahead and, and, and confirm that in the spring. But again, the Prime Minister said there will be no more money for the NHS without reform. Yep. And you are doing the money first. I know, but the reform has to come. I mean, it, it's together. It's not one or the other. There's money, but he, there is he, reform. But again, he was very clear. No, no more money. And, and now there's billions, and rightly, maybe, uh, yeah. going into the NHS before we've seen the reform. No, no, and an absolute expectation that reform starts immediately. There's no, there's no question of that, both in health and education and other areas of public services. Well, you, you can't just keep on this trajectory of more money without reform. It's a non-negotiable. <laughs> Except you have just no, done no, that. We've we had a long <laughs> number of years where that has been the case. Yeah. I mean, the, the reform that other, you know, there's the been chatter government reform. have asked for. There's been chatter of reform but uh, not delivery well reform. we haven't seen the delivery yet but we'll well, uh, we'll take time. what you say at, uh, well that's the problem how much time i mean paul johnson while we're talking about public services rachel reeves was very keen to emphasize there will be no return to austerity has she met that commitment well over the next two years with knobs on i mean this is a, a yeah. an enormous increase in spending this year and next uh, but as i understand it the increase between 2025, 20, 26, and the end of the forecast period is 1.5 percent a year. That is barely enough, and on some definitions, probably not enough, because we know that uh, national uh, health service will get a lot more than that, defence will get more than that, but and so on. So you might you and... might just about be able to hold non-protected departments constant in real terms over that period. You certainly wouldn't be able to get them going up in line with national income. So it might be just about enough, but it's. It's pretty close, but it is, we're saying, after a great big increase this year and next. Even with all these tax increases? Well, the big tax increases to a large extent are paying for the big increases that we're seeing this year and next. And, of course, they'll follow through. So total spending five or six years down the line will be a lot higher than under the what the OBR called fictional plans of the last government. You know, this government's absolutely right. I mean, the last government was planning big cuts mm. in day-to-day in -day spending, huge cuts in investment spending. Cuts almost certainly wouldn't have occurred, or if they had, would have been a big return to austerity. So this government's moved away from that. But it has really front-loaded its spending plans and it's going to be really tight after next year. Right, so there could be a return to almost austerity for unprotected, as we called them, departments. And we've already seen the state of our prisons with early release schemes and the need to build more prison places. What will happen in two years' time to, to, to the court system, to prisons? 
Yep, so there, there won't be a return to austerity, but Paul is totally right. The reason you get a big bump now is because we're wiping the slate clean from the inheritance we got from the Conservatives. We're filling in those black holes, we're settling public sector pay, we're setting the new honest baseline of public spending for public services, and then we build from there around reform and growth. So the second phase of the spending review will be difficult. There is no denying that, uh, and we will work through that over the coming months. But you're right, um, uh, there are issues across the whole of the public sector estate, whether it's the criminal justice system, health we've talked about, SEND in education, uh, looked after children, social care. There are lots of areas that we need to roll up our sleeves and get on with reforming. And that's now the hard yards and the work that we have to do as the government in the years ahead. Can I say, you, you made a claim at the beginning <clears> about how this would, it's going to have a one-off, like don't intend to come back for further tax rises. But if, if this picture of public spending doesn't work out, if the spending pressures require more top-ups, surely you will have to come back mm. for more tax rises later in the Parliament. Well, uh, as I say, our promise in the manifesto about not increasing income tax, national insurance or VAT on working people and our corporation tax rate for business uh, is a promise that we will honour for the whole time that we are in government before the next election. So that's a non-negotiable. Um, the second point is, of course, this reform and growth agenda we have to get right. That is the big challenge for us in government, and that's the challenge that we're accepting today that we have to uh, uh, prioritise. Can I ask you, there's a big claim made that the OBR has, if you like, helped you blame the previous government for this black hole. It's not, it's not quite like that in terms of the OBR review, is it? They don't really point the finger. They don't say that the forecast changes would have breached the fiscal wall, for example. Uh, well, what they do say is that they didn't have all the information that they should have had from the last government. And had they had that information, the forecast that they produced in March for the last Conservative budget would have been, quote, materially different, which has an impact in terms of the forecast that comes out today for this budget. Um, but not a 40 billion tax right raising impact. But still materially different, to okay. use the language of the OBR. The OBR is not political, it's independent, as you know, and it's been very clear about that. In the uh, way but that it's you might have gold plated what, they, what the OBR have said to, make a, uh, to justify the 40 billion in tax rises. It's not about justifying a choice, it's about dealing with the reality as we find it. And as I say, I recognise well, this is a, uh, a budget that matches the scale of the challenges we face, but that's it, the choice it, that we've except taken. Except, as you know, and in fact, I think uh, the IFS have said before, the books were open. Open. Darren, there was everything was we, there for you to be, well times. for you to look at. But again, it's about trust. People I have agree. got to trust you, and you I know agree. the polls recently have seen trust really yep. take a dip. Yep. Personally, against the prime minister and against the government as a whole. Yep. Now you may sit here and say we have kept to all our commitments, as we heard Rachel Reeve say, but people obviously don't agree with you. That cynicism you know? that has... that ha Well, because the polls are saying they feel you haven't There's or wouldn't be stuck... Uh, no, not since the budget, but on all of the discussion leading up to it about tax rises. Um, and actually, we have uh, a graphic to show... Oh, it's disappeared. ..to show the projection of uh, taxes going up as a proportion of GDP when you said that the previous Conservative government and other administrations had taken this country to the highest tax burden on record, but you're not going to be bringing it down anytime soon. So look, you know that I take this issue of trust and honesty personally very important. It's yeah. very important to me personally. I'm always honest and I always answer your questions clearly because I think it's important as politicians that we do that. But it is just wrong to say that any of us knew the state of the public finances because it has now become clear... Mm. That he, the, he said there was a fiscal fiction the whole way through and you should have, you know... But Paul we did, could have had a better but, debate but, before the election, but, I'll put it like but that. But let's be clear, Paul and the IFS did not know about the state of the reserve. The OBR didn't know about it, the public didn't know about it, Parliament didn't know about it and the Labour Party didn't know about it. The only people that did were Conservative ministers who failed to tell the country. We've committed today right. to recommendations from the OBR to make sure that never happens again because we, we will always be transparent about the state of the public finances. I'm being told very firmly we have to let you I'm go. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Darren Jones, uh, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, thank you very much and I understand you have to go too but Paul Johnson, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I'm just going to take you through uh, the key, the many key budget measures uh, from today Today from Rachel Reeves's statement. Employers' national insurance increases to raise £25 billion. That was the biggest figure as part of the £40 billion of tax rises. End to income tax threshold freeze coming in 28-29. Fuel duty frozen for another year. There had been discussion that might go up, but that's uh, being frozen, as is the 5p cut that has been in place. Capital gains tax rates 
increased at the lower and the higher rate. Uh, pensions will be subject to inheritance tax. They had been outside the inheritance tax estate, but they will now come inside it. We may be able to go over to some of the more more, I should say, uh, budget measures. Stamp duty surcharge for second homes. That is going up by 2%, if I've remembered it correctly, from the statement. That massive increase for the NHS in day-to-day -day spending that we were just talking about, £22.6 billion. Pounds. Just over £6.5 billion pounds for education capital spending. There is also more money going to cover breakfast clubs that had been talked about during the election campaign from some of the money raised. £5 billion pounds in house building investment. Again, something that Angela Rayner, the Deputy Prime Minister, will be very pleased about. And all part of the massive increase in spending. The defence budget increased to £2.9 billion. Pounds. Um, and finally, on this set of budget measures, uh, abolishing the non-DOM tax status from April next year. That was something, certainly something that was in the manifesto, as was VAT going up on private school fees. Uh, that apparently is starting in January. A cut to duty to draft alcohol. That got a big cheer by 1.7%, a penny off a pint. No doubt they'll be uh, making full use of that later on. £6.6 .6 billion pounds for the devolved nations. And £500 million pound increase for road maintenance. There is an awful lot for everybody to get their heads around in that budget. Uh, Rachel Reeves certainly did live up to the billing that it would be important and consequential. Um, and obviously Rishi Sunak, um, as uh, the leader of the opposition and former Chancellor, giving a very robust response. We've been joined by the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott. Hello, Hello to you. And by Alva Ray from Bloomberg. Uh, welcome to you too. Uh, Laura Trott, starting with you first of all, let's just get your reaction. It was very clear what Rishi Sunak said. He felt that the government had not been straight with the British people during the election. But that was your fault. Well, I said during the general election campaign that Labour were going to put up taxes by £38 billion. That turned out to be an underestimate of what was going to happen. Uh, this was clearly the budget that they wanted to deliver all along. Uh, it's something that they kept from the British people, that they plan to do. I think that's very obvious now. And it's full of broken promises. And let's look at the impact of this today. I, you know, I saw the end of your discussion with um, Darren. That growth is down. Inflation is up. This is not a positive budget. It's something that they didn't tell the British public about and has a really serious and difficult impact on the economy. Yes, but that's because they said you weren't straight with the state of the public finances, that there was a £22 billion black hole, that the litany, Rachel Reeves read out, of the state of the public services, from crumbling schools to crumbling hospitals uh, to waiting lists to prisons um, overcrowded and spilling out uh, with the early release schemes uh, being taken into trade. Do you accept that happened on your watch? Just to deal with one bit at a time, in terms of the OBR report, I've not read it in detail, but I understand that it doesn't stand up to £22 billion, as it shouldn't, because this was something which didn't exist. Well, of course, We just heard that the finances. OBR said it was materially different what they found out to what you, as Conservatives in the government before, gave them in information for that financial statement in March earlier this year. I think it's really important that they, um, they said it was nothing to do with ministers. This wasn't something that was directed to ministers at all. But I think the point is, like, they would say that, wouldn't they? This is the whole thing. They've got to create oh. a fig leaf um, in terms of making the Labour government for covering the fact that they weren't honest with the British public. And that's exactly the problem. Of course there are challenges in public finances. we just come out of COVID where we had to spend billions and billions of pounds. And then we had all the issues around energy prices and the energy price guarantee and funding that as well. Of course, public finances were under strain. We made some very difficult decisions to make sure that we uh, balanced the books. But things were starting to turn around. And what the Labour government have done is introduced £40 billion pounds worth mm. of tax rises <laughs> A very difficult point in the economy. It's going to make it more difficult to hire people. It's going to have a really serious impact on employment from what the OBR have said today, from the initial figures. Mm. You know, this is bad news for the British people, and it's not what they voted for. But Laura Trott, um, there was also a sense that taxes had reached their highest level yeah. on record 
under a Conservative government. Yeah. You can hardly sit here today and complain about a Labour government increasing taxes, yes, by a, a, a very a large lot. amount, but you brought it to the highest level ever. And they've now topped that. But the point is, Joe, is that we've, I've been on your show many, many times, right, and we have discussed this. It was very, very difficult as a Conservative a politician to put up taxes, but we had to do it because we spent so much money during COVID and we spent so much money supporting energy, people's energy prices mm. and because we are fiscally responsible. That's what we had to do. But the economy was turning a corner because of those difficult decisions and we were able to start the process of bringing down people's taxes. Right, but you said you were going to make tax cuts at some yeah, point. How absolutely. would they have been affordable well, on the basis of what we've just heard today, Laura Trott? That would not have been responsible. No, we had a plan for dealing with the pressures, which was to bring down the benefit bill significantly, to cap the number of civil servants. But I'm not saying these were easy decisions. They were not straightforward. They would have been very, very difficult. Yeah, but right. we had a plan to deal with them, and it was fully costed, and it was set up the election. I seriously regret, by the way, but because of the difficult decision, because of the things that we got wrong in the last parliament, right? We really did get a lot of things wrong. And because of that, during the general election campaign, I don't think we got the hearing that we needed to have on the economy. And I'm really sorry about that because we've ended up with this awful government who are now raising people's taxes and causing huge problems with growth and inflation. Right, well, and that is partly our fault because of the, the mistakes that we've made. But I will tell you right now that we will spend every single moment fighting this because it is the wrong thing to do. Well, you've talked about growth. You say there was good growth. Rishi Sunak uh, said yeah. the same. But let's just have a look at this graph, economic growth since the pandemic to, uh, against comparable G7 countries. It's a very poor record. A very poor record, Laura Trott. Look at the UK. Yes, it's above Germany, which is even worse, but it's behind all those other countries. And that's in the last few years, during and since the pandemic. There is not a good record on growth under your governments. We had the highest growth in the G7. For a left. point, for yeah, a but, point. But, but this, but this yeah, it was a quarter. Yeah, I mean, anyone can pick a quarter and say we had good growth then. This is over a period of time since the pandemic. It was not good. We were turning around the economy. We had the highest growth in the G7 when we left. Right. But, but that might have just been one quarter, never to be seen again. You've got to take a longer period. This is from 2019. I think it's the final quarter of 2019 all the way through to this year. And we are behind Japan, France, Italy, Canada and the USA. And the Labour government came in promising to boost growth. And what have we seen today? Growth is going down. Faisal. I, I'm intrigued. Um, I mean... On the black hole point, I mean, obviously you deny the extent of it, but yeah. clearly you did not account for things like public sector wage settlements. You just didn't account for it. The, the wage year started in April true. under your government and you didn't put aside any money. So, well, we so you'd have cut public sector pay we, we for hadn't, nurses. We hadn't, agreed, we hadn't agreed the public sector pay deals. For Three months after they're due to start. No, I know, I know. Um, but we hadn't agreed those because it, we You're were... You're going to leave it to the, the next end, government, I No, 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 we were towards the end of a spending review and we were having discussions with departments about how much pay they could absorb. Well, that right? spending because review you was can delayed only do, too. But you can only do what you can afford. And what this government done has just... Im said that we were, they were completely adding on top of departmental settlements, the pay costs, without looking at whether there is affordability at all in departments, well, which I think is the wrong decision. Well, hang on on that. On the, but the guidelines must have come from the Conservative government at the time for the 5.5%. That must have been what you were uh, discussing because they usually go, the pay review bodies, on the sort of recommendations or at least guard, guidelines from the government. But so it it's not true to say you have not actually... Well, it so it was 5.5%. You, you no, agreed with it, it. It depends on what is affordable. And it, it, each of the independent pay review bodies come back with different recommendations depending on the, the workforces. So you would have given, if you had won the election, public sector workers a real terms pay cut. That's what would have happened if you'd have been no, given this budget. No, th this no, is, no, no, this you've got to accept one or the other. It's a complicated process in terms of how much people will be getting and it depends on affordability within departments. We, That's a detailed process of negotiation. That's why it takes time. And that is why it's ridiculous to say that this should just be put on top of departmental budgets without having that conversation about how much they can afford. But in a similar vein, you're suggesting there that you might not have given such generous, you might call them, pay rises to the public sector, but we don't know about that. Similarly, the government today has announced a huge amount of money for the NHS. Are you saying that the NHS doesn't need that money? I think the point is, is that we, we hadn't done a spending review yet. This is something that they've done. Uh, we we had done the spending review is what, is what No, we're... no, I, I don't agree with you, actually, because I think that... Uh, necessarily a general election, and we all know where the polls were looking at the general election, there are different priorities within departments. But to you give must departments, have a view on whether you think departments, no, no, public just, services sorry, need more money. But, but just a, to, to give departments a settlement and for then that to be upended by general election, I think would have been the wrong thing to do, absolutely. We'd set out our fiscal framework um, of the 1% over the next parliament, which 
By the way, it's very interesting today because Rachel Reeves says that she's ending austerity. Mm. She's halving the rate of departmental increases well, that we had in the last... Austerity. But, but we had a 3% increase a year in the last parliament. She's talking about a 1.5% now. But you had a 1% earmarked. Yeah, but, but I'm saying for over, the last, over the last parliament, we increased... Yeah, but looking uh, ahead, by 3%. If, you know, and yes, you're no, no longer in government, yeah. but you can see today there's a huge amount of money gone into the NHS. Labour's argument is that they had a mandate because people were fed up looking around and thinking things don't work anymore. Do you not accept that? But just to that? be clear, Rachel Reeves has made a big song and dance about ending austerity and she's halved the rate of increase in departmental spending that we saw over the last parliament. Can I, I just want people just, to be really clear just, about that. Just, just, before, just before we let you go, I want to go back to the record on public services because, yep. as Vicky said, they, they've got a mandate the Labour government. But they won a landslide. So they but let me, had a let me, they were honest about what they well, were going to they, do before well, the election, they, but they, they did well, not do that. We can have that argument. They, of yep. course, argue that they've kept to their commitments. But they've got that mandate. And they've got that mandate and they've made a decision based on what they think people voted for. Um, because under previous Conservative governments, inflation reached a record high, over 11%. Mortgages went up after the mini-budget of Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. I've just said the tax burden got to a record high. And yet, public services were creaking. Um, and that's according, just for one example, to the former Justice Secretary, uh, Alex Chalk. Prisons overcrowded, councils going bust, endless strikes, NHS waiting lists went up. And we will judge the Labour government on these things yep. too. But do you accept, as you said, you made mistakes during the campaign, no one's going to listen to you when it comes to public services? Well, I think also the point is, is around inflation, which you mentioned there, Joe. We took really, really tough decisions, including on public sector pay, by the way, to bring inflation down. Inflation is going back up again. That will have serious impacts for every household across the country. And everybody needs to know that because of the decisions that this government is taking, their cost of living are going to go up. Now, of course, as I said before, we had some very difficult decisions to make because we had to pay back the money that we spent during COVID and take, support people with their energy prices. That cost money, we needed to balance the books. Oh, right. Jojo, can I just ask, uh, Laura, one yeah. quick thing. Right. During the election That's campaign... That's always dangerous. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> during the election campaign, you did... Uh, we, you know, we gave Darren Jones a hard time about the manifesto yeah. commitments, but you did acknowledge that employers' national insurance was left open by the mm. Labour manifesto. And do you know what not? Darren's response was? This was a list of things that Labour isn't doing. That was his response. But, or, but you did the accuse them of wanting yeah, to do and, it. And, and yeah, exactly, campaign. exactly. Yeah. Okay. And he just said that that's that. what yeah. the, the, the Labour aren't doing. Laura that's what he said. Thank you very much for being you, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And I think we have to say goodbye to uh, yes. Faisal Islam at some point. You don't have to rush off just now. <laughs> but we are going to Leeds to join Alex Forsyth, who is there uh, with people either that she's spoken to who are watching uh, the budget and getting a reaction uh, to it. Alex, over to you. Yeah, watching very closely, Joe. Big budget, long budget, hugely significant budget. And we are at Pudsey Leisure Centre in the heart of the community here in Pudsey, Pudsey, which is in Rachel Reeves' constituency with people from a range of different industries and sectors to try and work out what some of this is going to mean in the real world. We can talk to some of them now. We're joined by Amanda McLaren, hello, who's the managing director of a big textile manufacturing business here in Pudsey, employing more than 200 people, presumably... Some of those measures that will really impact you are those employer national contrib insurance contribution increases yes. and the minimum wage. Have you had a chance to assess what the impact might be? Yeah, I mean, we've got to work through the, the financial impact of this budget, but without doubt, it feels like employers have taken you know, a very big hit of the 40 billion, um, with almost half of it going to employers. I think the national minimum wage impact, once again, is hard hitting after three successive increases in prior years that were also quite hefty. Um, and in addition to that, the increase of 1.2% on national insurance to 15%, um, coupled with the impact of the threshold, moving from 9,100 to 5,000 as a huge, huge impact on our business, and I'm sure many others. So uh, quite unexpected in terms of a triple hit. And so when the Chancellor is talking about growth being the central ambition of this government, and that you see what you're calling a hit to business. How do those things marry? Does that mean you're going to continue it, to grow? It's Can a compromise, you? without doubt. It's compromised to the costing model, compromised to next year's budget and how we determine you know, where the costs that we want to spend should go and how far we can go. Um, obviously, growth to every business is important. We've, we must reinvest. Um, some of the positives I heard was reference with Make UK and the institutions and bodies within manufacturing in the UK that will be looking to support 
perhaps capital investments or research and development and innovation. So we have to give that commitment. But equally, there's some constraint when you hit with um, you know the, the increases that we've seen today. Also here is Max Shepherd from the Yorkshire Building Society, which has got its headquarters in Bradford, so not far from where we are here in Pudsey. Max Shepherd, thank you very much for being here. Again, back to that point, the government keeps talking about growth, saying that the focus of its budget, the way to get investment in public services is to grow the economy. Are you convinced that what Rachel Reeves announced today is going to realise that ambition? It's been a really interesting budget, hasn't it? Because on the one hand, you've got the 40 billion of tax increases to you know go towards the public service um, uh, increase in spending. But on the other hand, you've also got that 100 billion pound commitment in capital investment, which will directly um, stimulate the economy going forward over the next five years. So it's very difficult to tell from an economic perspective, but she certainly has a plan in it. And you know that what she's laid out certainly will stimulate the economy from a capital investment point of view. So there were a lot of conversations pre-budget about whether or not the relaxation of some of the fiscal rules, particularly around borrowing, might send a shiver through the market. So are you getting any sense yet of what the impact of this budget is going to be? Yeah, so the initial market reaction actually hasn't been, there's not been any spook moment. It looks pretty stable. So interest rate expectations have stayed pretty stable um, throughout, the, throughout the day, throughout the morning. Um, so no, there's not been anything as of yet. And this is really because Reeves is saying a lot of this increase in borrowing is all down to that, is going to go on capital investment. Yeah. Also here is James Barwise from the Road Haulage Association. James, we spoke a little bit earlier about what you might be looking out for in this budget. There was a bit of good news for your sector, which is that one year at least freeze in fuel duty. What's the likely impact of that? Well, this is fantastic news for hauliers, not just here in Yorkshire, but up and down the country. It's something we at the Road Haulage Association have been campaigning for in the run-up to the budget. And we know through analysis this will save the average haul haulier um, across the country at least £2,000 a year. That is an incredible relief for hauliers who the last couple of years have really been feeling the pinch in the perfect storm of financial conditions. But we also know that over the next five years, if the proposed hike of five pence per litre had gone up, it would cost UK GDP 430 million. So it's really encouraging that the Chancellor is starting to think about these measures, not just in terms of the benefit for the industry, but the wider economic benefit that the relationship between freight and logistics has in growing the UK economy. And back to the point that we heard right at the very beginning about the impact of this budget on business. What's your thoughts? Well, this is just for the first year and there's lots of measures we still need to see. For example, there's a huge conversation to be had about the relationship between road building schemes, freight and logistics and how you grow the economy. We didn't hear much from the Chancellor today about schemes such as the A66, the duelling of the A1 up in Northumberland, or of course Lower Thames Crossing, the decision on that has been postponed. So there's an ongoing dialogue the industry needs to have with the government about how we can support them achieve their economic aims. But in the short term, huge relief for hauliers up and down the country. Quick thought from you, Max Shepherd. was there anything that wasn't in the budget you really would have liked to have seen? Yeah, so one thing we would have liked is an extension of the uh, increase in the stamp duty thresholds. So now you'll, from April 2025, any home mover purchasing a house over £125,000 will be subject to stamp duty. So if you were buying an average home of £280,000 in the UK, you will now pay £4,000 in terms of uh, stamp duty as opposed to £1,500 um, before this budget. So that is that is one of, the, one of the concerns we have for the housing market. And Amanda, final one to you. Again, a lot of talk pre-budget about the potential impact on consumer confidence and business confidence when it comes to investment. It always takes a while to digest the detail of a budget, but from what you've seen from the Chancellor today in that 80 minutes or so that she stood up, what is your sense about the confidence of business in the current economic climate that she's set out? I think there'll be a cautious approach uh, at the beginning to understand you know, tangibly what is actually changing and see that happening. I think there's some sense of optimism. I do think there are you know, outlooks of growth and certainly potential for businesses. Um, I just think that we need you know, balanced support. Um, that means whether it be capital investment through grant support for businesses, um, consideration to investment for, for growth generally, I think that that's going to be really important and businesses are going to be looking for that support. Thank you all very much. So some reaction from across industry and different sectors here in Pudsey, the Chancellor's constituency. As ever, the full details of the budget are going to emerge over the next few hours and days, Joe. But I think what's very clear is that people are already considering what is going to be the real world impact of this very significant first budget from 
a Labour government and from Rachel Reeves. Alex Forsyth there. Yes, thank you very much. It does always take a little bit of time to not just look at the small print but digest the numbers and the scale of this budget because it was big in every sense. So let's get a flavour of that in terms of reaction and analysis from the BBC's economics correspondent Andy Verity because £40 billion of tax rises is a big number Andy Verity and people have been writing into you to say national insurance on employers going up um, that makes up the the vast majority probably of those tax rises but but what about the rest Yes, it's about 25 billion out of the 40 billion tax rises, Joe. And when you break it down per employee, so they're lowering the threshold at which the employer starts paying 15% national insurance contributions, not 13.8 as it was. If you lower that threshold, it means 615 pounds is extra per employee. And that's before you start levying the amount beyond that threshold. So it's a substantial extra cost for employers and as you say it's big so if you look at the big numbers here we, we're talking about an additional tax burden of about uh, 25 billion next year 24 billion rising to 41 billion in 2029 to 30 but the spending numbers are even bigger so spending rises by 25 billion this year 63 billion next year going up to 74 billion additional mm. amounts that's all because of the measures to support public services. In a way, this is a very traditional Labour budget. It's, we've looked at the distributional analysis as well. There's a document there, Treasury's distributional analysis suggests that the top tenth of earners yes. will be the ones who are hardest hit. Everybody uh, else will benefit. What questions are our viewers sending you? Well, we've had various questions talking about capital gains tax, for example. What could the government do about capital gains tax is one. One question that's come in, and well, we know now, what they've done is they've raised the lower rate that you pay if you're a basic rate taxpayer from 10% to 18%. The higher rate, if you pay 40%, has gone up from 20 to 24%, and that takes it closer to the sort of tax rates that you'll pay on, on income, on in the income from work. Also, um, inheritance tax. Farmers won't like this budget much because it means if they pass on the farm to their children, then in excess of £1 million, they'll pay a rate of about 20%. They have benefited from higher exemptions. Those who hold shares in the alternative investment market, they're going to pay tax at 20%. And also you've got things like stamp duty for landlords will mm. go up the additional rate that they pay from 3 to 5%. So that's part of the reason why the axe is falling heavily on the top tenth of earners, whereas according to the Treasury, everybody else is going to benefit to the tune of about £600 net each, roughly. Andy Verity there in the newsroom and we will hopefully have time to come back to you uh, and answer some more viewers' questions. Let's go to Central Lobby uh, because Ed Davey, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, will have responded to the budget in the House of Commons. The Deputy Leader Daisy Cooper is with us now. Welcome to you. First of all, your response to what was a mammoth budget. Well, we Liberal Democrats had called on the government to produce a budget that was going to save our NHS and care. And so we welcome the fact the government is going to invest in our NHS. But we know and they know that our NHS will remain on life support until they really get to grips with the social care crisis. So we are very disappointed that the government have not addressed the social care crisis um, through this particular budget. And we're also concerned that the burden of the tax rises will undoubtedly fall on small businesses and family farms as well. Right, and on that, yes, you opposed that increase to employer national insurance contributions and you said that Labour should have gone further in raising taxes on big businesses. Uh, of course, they are increasing the levy on oil and tax, uh, oil and gas, I should say, companies. But the Institute of Fiscal Studies said your manifesto tax pledges weren't victimless. All taxes on businesses are ultimately felt by real people and some combination of shareholders, including wages and people's pensions. Do you accept that? that. Well, it's not a case of whether they're victimless or not. The fact of the matter is that there are some really big corporations that have made billions of pounds in profits, yeah. and we think that many of them could actually pay a, a little bit more. I'll give you one quick example. Just last year, four of the largest banks yeah. made £40 billion yeah. But they'll just pass profits. that on. But they'll just pass that on. That's what the IFS is saying, that they will just pass that on to working people. 
the big banks made £40 billion in one year, and we think they can afford to pay £4 billion of that, £4 billion of those profits, to, uh, to help get our public services back on their feet. We pointed to the big banks who could pay more. We pointed to the big gambling companies. We pointed to the big tech companies as well. The way that we wanted to reform capital gains tax would have been much fairer. It would have reduced capital gains for uh, two-thirds of people whilst charging more to the 0.1% of wealthiest people. So we have many ideas that would have generated uh, more tax income for the government, but we would have protected small businesses, uh, small farmers uh, and pensioners as well. Right, you say you would have protected those things, particularly small businesses, but actually the former governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, said you can only raise significant amounts of money by raising taxes on most people. If you wanted to fund everything that you set out in your manifesto, then you would have to raise taxes on income tax and VAT and national insurance. But in our manifesto, which was fully funded, we didn't have any plans to do any of those things. Yeah, we made but it really. saying you wouldn't have been able to do then the things that you wanted to do or raise the sorts of money. And if you did go ahead with those taxes on big businesses and banks, as I say again, it would have been passed on to customers. The fact of the matter is that there are big corporations that have made millions, if not billions of pounds in profits. We set out very clearly in our manifesto that we wanted to raise taxes on those big corporations that have the broadest shoulders whilst protecting small businesses and struggling families as well. We set out what those plans were and we had got a record result for us, returning 72 Liberal Democrat MPs, making us the third largest party in Parliament yes. for 100 years. And we still urge the government to look at some of those measures to reduce the burden on small businesses. Well, well using your parliamentary influence, You've talked about social care and how disappointed you are that there wasn't more in the budget about that important issue. What is happening in terms of cross-party talks? What is happening in terms of Liberal Democrats persuading the government to take this on? Well, as part of the budget today, you will have heard uh, the Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, uh, talking about the fact that they are going to actually raise the allowance for carers. Yes. Um, to, uh, and that is a direct result of, and she even name-checked our party leader, Ed Davey, that is a direct result of Liberal Democrat influence over the last few weeks. We've also managed to get the uh, government to agree to do a review of the cliff edge, which has resulted in uh, many carers um, overpaying by a few pounds and then being penalised for thousands of pounds by the Department for Work and Pensions. So so we are already having an impact on the government and their thinking, but we are urging the government to go much, much further. They haven't reached out to us to ask about cross-party talks yet, and they know and we know we have got to get to grips with the social care crisis. The Labour government cannot think that social care is a second-term issue. Daisy Cooper for the Liberal Democrats there in Central Lobby. Thank you very much. Let's get some more reaction and analysis uh, from our guests here in the studio. We've been joined by Alva Ray from Bloomberg and Caroline Wheeler, the political editor of the Sunday Times. First of all, to you, Caroline, because there was uh, an announcement. We knew uh, that it was going to be met about compensation, compensation for two big scandals, as Rachel Reeves talked about. One of them you've been directly involved in. Yes, that's right. We got the announcement finally the first time that compensation has been scored uh, in the Red Book for either the contaminated blood scandal, which is the tragedy that I've been uh, involved with for the past 20 years, calling for a, a full and fair settlement for the survivors of this uh, particular scandal, but also for the post office horizon scandal. I mean, significantly for, um, for us, uh, there was an announcement there will be £11.8 mm. billion pounds mm. made available uh, for the uh, survivors and the victims of the contaminated blood scandal. That will of course be spread over a couple of years uh, partly because they've uh, really want to receive some of the payments as ongoing support payments which has been one of the rows that's been ongoing around the way in which this compensation is paid but a, a really big moment but what was quite interesting about the announcement was that Rachel Reeves really pointed the finger again at the last government and said they hadn't budgeted for this compensation which is um, a little bit of a surprise given that when we were reporting on this earlier on in the year when the inquiry uh, came back we were talking about sums of around £10 billion. Now, there has always been a suspicion that that was one of the reasons why we had the general election when we did, because actually that, that compensation tag actually ate up a lot of the headroom had the government have waited mm. another few months to have had the election in, in the autumn. Alva Ray, if we sort of pull back a little and go back to the opening part of Rachel Reeves's statement uh, on the budget, how successful do you think she was in really pinning the blame 
and the poor inheritance on the previous Conservative government. She certainly made a few jokes at their expense uh, throughout the budget, but she really did set out very clearly as a justification for taking those big decisions she has on tax and spend and borrowing, blamed it on the Conservatives. Well, I mean, so she began by saying, you know, it's not the first time that it's fallen to a Labour government to rebuild Britain, mentioning the sort of the past three times in the 20th century that Labour has come into government, um, 1945, 1964 and 1997. Mm. And Rachel Rees does have this quite historic sense and she, she always talks that way. That's not a sort of recent thing. And I think she will have kind of enjoyed trying to situate herself in that tradition. She got yes. lots of cheers for that. I'm not sure how successful it will have been. I mean, she immediately just upfront said how big the tax increase would yes. be. 40 billion pounds. That's yeah. higher than we were expecting even. Yes. And beats the last Labour record um, of Dennis Healy and is probably uh, actually just a complete record. So not just one of the biggest tax raising events in, in the UK, but probably the biggest. Um, so I think that's, a, that's quite a big surprise, actually, because we'd been suspecting that she might just try to go just below the Yes, well, about to, 35 yeah, billion is to, what to, we had To thought. avoid that headline, um, you know, to just cut, cut in um, so it wasn't the record. So I think she just sort of fronted it up. She said any Chancellor would be in that position. Um, but I think it's tricky because, I mean, Laura Trott was making this argument. It's tricky for the Tories to make this argument because they were no better during the mm. election campaign. But we were all saying, you know, Paul Johnson, who was sitting here earlier, mm. was saying there was a conspiracy of silence yes. between the two parties over the need to increase taxes. We asked them again and again and again, and they said that there would be no big surprises on tax. Mm. So I think you're right to say, zooming out, what is this, what is this budget? It's the biggest tax-raising budget ever after an election a few months ago where Labour didn't say they were going to increase taxes. I think that there is a big question about whether they have a mandate for this. And I think that that's probably the biggest thing that Labour MPs will be worried about. The big question about how it lands. The front page is tomorrow. Is that what they will go in on? You know, we didn't vote for this. Mm. Were we asked about well, this? The biggest I, yeah. tax raise. Well, it yeah. would be interesting to uh, see the headlines, obviously, tomorrow morning. Yes, what do you make of that, Vicky? Well, I think there's a question, isn't there, of... Are they front-loading, if you like, the pain? Now, we heard Darren Jones there talking about, look, we won't be coming back for more. Well, you know, have to wait and see. But, you know, if you're going to do this kind of thing, and let's be honest about it, if the Conservatives have been re-elected, they would have been putting up taxes, maybe not in this way, but they would have had to probably as well to, mm. to deal with all the things that you've been talking about. And there's a question of whether voters will have forgotten about this by the time it gets to the next election? Will they have seen any improvements in public services that make them think, OK, yeah, the taxes went up, yeah. but actually at least now the waiting lists in the NHS have gone down? And there is a question when you talk about the mandate. Is there goodwill? Do voters have this goodwill towards this Labour government? Now, if you look at the opinion polls, they mm. suggest that they don't. Yeah. Now, partly this is to do with the way it was handled, the missteps you might call them in the run-up to this budget, with the winter fuel allowance being the sort of thing that was announced in isolation and got so much attention. I mean, if it had been announced, and I know there were reasons they couldn't do it this mm. late, but if it had been announced as, as part, part of, of this, this, it probably yes. would have got slightly lost, but, you know, there would have still been anger. Um, but I think there is a question there about whether voters will give this government the benefit of the doubt in terms of do they trust them to spend this money wisely and make sure that they do improve. Well, let's come back to uh, that, the sort of guardrails, if you like, uh, that Rachel Reeves has said she has set out very clearly in terms of how they spend that money and whether it will be valued for money. But let's get some more political reaction uh, because Matthew Amrolawale is on uh, College Green outside the Houses of Parliament with some guests. Matthew. Joe, thanks very much. Very interesting listening to your conversation there. Yes, a record tax-raising budget, bigger than Norman Lamont's in the early 1990s. So let's get some thoughts from my guests here, joined by uh, Stephen Flynn from the SNP, Zia Yusuf from Reform and Carla Denier from the Greens. We've had a little pause in the various protests around College Green at the moment, so uh, let's take advantage of it. Uh, in terms of headline thoughts, Stephen. Well, of course, if you're a, an individual, a pensioner, who's just lost your winter fuel allowance, if you're a, a family who are suffering under the two-child cap, you'll be looking at the budget going, what's changed? Nothing. You've still got to deal with the consequences of this. If you're a small or medium-sized business, you'll be going, what have we done wrong? Why do we deserve this massive increase in taxation, which is going to impact our ability to grow? If you're a homeowner, you'll be looking at this going, why are my mortgage rates going to be going up as a result of what the Chancellor's announced? And if you're someone who looks at the wider economy, you'll be saying, why is the economy going to be flat? when the Chancellor promised a transformative growth budget. It's massively underwhelming. Lots of issues raised. We'll come back to it. Yeah. If you're listening to this at home and you work hard in the private sector, 
and every year your salary never seems to go up as much as the cost of living, then make no mistake, this Labour budget is making you poorer still. By increasing the tax on jobs, they're increasing the employer's contribution to national insurance meaningfully, and they're also doing it uh, to the most disproportionately to those who earn the least by increasing the threshold. So what they're doing is they are by the back door, betraying their promise in the manifesto not to, not to increase taxes on working people. The OBR have said two-thirds to 75% of those increased costs will be passed on in terms of real wages to hard-working British people. Labour lied to get into power. Carla Denier, in terms of what you've heard today, what you hoped to hear and what you actually saw delivered. I think this budget's a missed opportunity. I was looking for a budget that makes this country fairer and our economy greener and the Chancellor could have chosen to be brave and to fund our future by taxing the super rich. There's an increasing groups of MPs for across all parties and organisations who were calling on her to do that but instead she ducked it and while there were some good things in the budget there were too many examples of her giving with one hand and taking away with another like an increase in funding for the NHS I welcome that but by keeping the two child benefit cap by by keeping the limits on winter fuel payment she's keeping in place policies that harm people's health and harm costs on the uh, increased costs on the NHS. Carla you said it was a missed opportunity uh, Rachel Reeves talked about making responsible choices today. Now, in the election campaign, the IFS accused both Reform and the Greens of poisoning the entire political debate by suggesting your manifesto plans could make a difference while being, quote, entirely unattainable. Today was the real world, wasn't it? Other organisations had different comments about our manifesto. Uh, your wealth tax experts said that, 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 our, that our offering was credible. Um, and, and, and a number of other organisations commented and said this is the closest to reality that we've seen. So I'm going to continue to put pressure on the Chancellor to ask those with the broadest shoulders to contribute the most because what she's done in this budget is she's proposing to raise around 25 billion from tax changes that will mostly affect lower and middle income people small and medium sized enterprises and only around 5 billion from the super rich through changes to capital gains tax the green party thinks that that's the wrong way around so we'd flip that that emphasis around so that those with the broader shoulders the really super rich who can afford to pay a little bit extra do so so, yeah, coming back to what was announced, the point that you were making earlier, Rachel Rees making the point that working people, they won't see a difference in their pay slips. And then when you look where some of the money has gone in terms of raising taxes, schools, education, investment, where else would you have put it? Well, firstly, Rachel Reeves, that is dishonest. It's lying by omission because, yes, you're not going to explicitly see it itemised in your pay slip, but because you are increasing the cost of employing, people and increasing disproportionately in this budget the cost of paying and employing the lowest paid people in this country of course that's going to affect people's paychecks. You're talking and, about and employers the, aren't the, you? The employers employees. are paying that tax but the reality is it will hit the hard-working British people in their paycheck. The OBR have said that themselves so that's just simply dishonest. They've done it in a very sneaky way. They've absolutely betrayed their manifesto commitment and in terms of difficult choices so often we're told in this country we have to make difficult choices. How about we make some difficult choices in service of the British people? We spend 12.8 billion... Well, I told you what the IF said about your plans in the election. Well, we, one of our plans was saying, look, we would halve our foreign aid budget, £12.8 billion pounds per year. If you cut that in half, we can spend that on better schools, a better NHS. We can do so many things with that money. You also look, we spend more than £4.5 billion pounds on asylum claims. And by the way, the winter fuel allowance that was just mentioned a moment ago, we shouldn't forget the 10 million odd pensioners in this country who have contributed to the system their whole lives, who are having their pension, uh, their winter fuel allowance taken from them. That was apparently to save just £1.5 So we have government after government that puts foreign citizens ahead of the interests of British people. Stephen Flynn, coming to the winter fuel payments, you were making the point how vital it was for pensioners in Scotland. Scotland has received significantly more money today from the Chancellor. Uh, you have the power to spend it in the way you want. So uh, will you reintroduce 
those payments to those vulnerable pensioners you've been talking about? Well, well, of course, what we're talking about here is two slightly different things. From what the Chancellor said today, we still need to look at the detail of it because it's only just happened. There is going to be significantly more money as it happens coming to Scotland, but that money is going to be for the likes of the NHS and for education, the things we have responsibility for. It doesn't have for. to be, though, does it? When, when we're looking at the winter fuel allowance... It doesn't allowance, have to be, though, does it? When we're looking at the winter fuel allowance, the UK government reduced Scotland's budget by £160 million, which would have paid for that benefit to be the delivered. That, to you but that is money that has not been you have provided. said it is so vital, you have extra money, you have the capacity to spend it any way you want to, so you could reinstate it no, if no, you wanted I, to. I'm afraid the argument that you're actually making there is that the money we're, we're receiving for our NHS we should divert into the winter fuel allowance to mitigate against the Labour Party. That's not the purpose of the Scottish Parliament. The purpose of the Scottish Parliament is to deal with devolved competencies based upon the money that we have in the best interest of the people of Scotland. If the Labour Party, and I didn't hear Rachel Reeves say this, if they want to give us £160 million to plug the black hole they created on the winter fuel allowance, We'll take it and we'll make sure the pensioners can get it. But what Rachel, we've said nothing on this today. And as a result, nearly 900,000 pensioners in Scotland are going to have a cold winter this year. And that's simply not good enough for a Labour Party that supposedly cares. Caledonia, £22 billion extra for the NHS. That is what the public want. I do welcome the announcement on the increase in day-to-day -day funding for the NHS. That is um, also something that the Green Party was push pushing for in the general election. However, so many of the policies that Rachel Reeves has put forward in this bill, they just don't make sense. So giving with one hand with NHS funding and taking away with the other by cutting funding for things that help people's health. Um, there's also um, uh, the, 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 the situation with transport is another one that doesn't make any sense to me. So she's freezing fuel duty until 2028-29. Um, but she's increasing buses outside of London by 50% for the for, for the single the fare bus cap. Yeah, so 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 we're travelling by public transport sure. by bus is already more expensive I'm, than driving. I'm and nearly she's out of time, so, so let me just whiz down 20 seconds each, if you would, in terms of the change to the fiscal rules, investment in key things, hospitals, schools, transport, energy. Uh, aren't those? the areas where we need desperate investment, desperate growth. Well, look, we spent the entire general election campaign telling the Labour Party that their conspiracy of silence with the Tories on the economy would result in this. We told them that they need to, needed to invest. They've done, so something well, in, they've done something in terms of investment, but the impact upon real people in everyday life is not going to be there in the way that it should. See ya. This budget is also an assault on ambition and an assault on growth. The OBR downgrading. You don't welcome any of those announcements. I just talked about the, investment in those areas. Of course, we need to invest in things like the NHS, but we also have an exploding population that is a, that is causing our NHS to buckle under pressure. So you have to address the population explosion, or we're never going to solve the problem. Carla, just a final 20 seconds. The Chancellor's self-imposed fiscal straitjacket never made any sense, so I'm glad that she's loosened that. I hope she'll use it to do things like bringing the water companies back into public ownership to end the sewage scandal. Well, look, we've run out of time, but thanks all of you for your time. Carla Denia, Zia Youssef and Stephen Flynn joining me here on the Green at Westminster. Joe, it's back to you there in the studio. Thank you very much, Matthew. Let's go straight over to the BBC's business editor, Simon Jack, as, of course, business very much at the heart of this budget in those tax increases on national insurance contributions. What's been the reaction, Simon? Well, a, a, a telegraphed bombshell is still a bombshell. And as you say, they were handed the lion's share of the bill for this uh, £40 billion budget mm. with £25 billion on national insurance alone for employers. Now, the gasp that came out from the business community was not so much the 1.2 per cent, taking it from 13.8 to no. 15, but lowering the threshold at which you start paying it to salaries of £5,000 and above from 9100 That was unexpected and would bring a lot more businesses into scope. So you've got, for example, the Institute of Directors saying it's a painful budget for business. The uh, British Chambers of Commerce saying a tough budget for business to swallow. But they say the Chancellor has looked to ease the pain by holding out a promise of better days ahead. Having said that, um, there's not a lot of growth bang for billions of bucks mm. in this when you look at the OBR's forecast. And I think that is the acid test that people will say is that we're prepared to st stomach quite a lot if we can get out of this cycle of low growth, but you haven't managed to convince the OBR to any great extent that that is going to happen. You've got a big bit of an increase in the early years and then a bit of a downgrade in the later years. So they're saying, is that worth it? And when you add 
the increase in national insurance to that overnight rise we saw in the national minimum wage, yes. a plethora of new workers' rights. You are making it more expensive to hire, riskier to hire, more difficult to fire people. And the risk they will take with this is that will deter the very growth they're trying to generate. Well, and on that, I mean, that is where the contradiction, if you like, lies in that the very uh, part of industry or the engine of driving that growth you've just been talking about is mainly on businesses and employers and entrepreneurship. You know, is there any sort of climate that they think businesses that you've spoken to from that budget that will encourage them to invest, to expand, to take more people on? Well, I mean, the government has been big on this message to stability. They're saying, listen, we've had four mm. prime ministers, six chancellors in the last eight years. That is going to change. And so we'll have a more stable framework. They're setting a lot of store by that. They're also saying, look, as far as possible, this is going to be a once and done tax raid on businesses and from here on in we'll give you an industrial strategy that you call for we'll give you a business tax roadmap we're going to cap business uh, tax on profits for the remainder of this parliament so although this is painful this you know should be a reset and from here on things will be a lot more visible and you can take a lot more you know, a lot more comfort from the clarity they were going to provide. Having, but, yeah, as you say, it is going to be very interesting to see whether, you know, you're essentially strangling the goose that you're hoping is going to lay the golden eggs of the future with these upfront tax rises. All right, Simon Jack, uh, thank you very much. Let's just get some more reaction um, here. Vicky, first of all, um, just listening to the sort of business reaction generally, hardly a surprise, um, but the government needs business on board and they spent a lot of time trying to woo them and court them uh, during the election campaign. Yeah they did and as you say growth is the thing that Rachel Reeves has been talking about an awful lot and that she is relying on uh, and if you talk to small businesses now there are some mitigating things that she's put into place here and the trouble is it's going to be up to each business to work out whether they're going to be one of the businesses that might not pay as much national insurance so we'll have to see where the bill falls if you like but if you talk to small business owners in the hospitality industry as I did this week I was in Birmingham you know, they're really worried about this. They're worried about the minimum wage. If that's going up, they have to pay for that. And they're saying, look, of course, in the end, they do, and they say reluctantly, have to pass this on to either the customer, if it's in hospitality, or in terms of, of pay rises not happening for the employee. Now, as I say, each one will have to look here. Rachel Rees made some claims there about there'll be lots of people who are paying less. So, you know, we'll have to work that out, and it will be up to each business to do that, to see where that actual bill does In fall. terms of the reaction public reaction. We've spent a lot of time discussing how honest Labour were during the election about no taxes going up on working people, what is a working person uh, and so on. How much damage do you think, if any, has been done? I think it's a really big gamble that the government are taking because, you know, when people looked at that manifesto, when they looked at the kind of triple tax lock that we saw, which was not raising VAT, not raising income tax, not raising NICs, you know, it was what wasn't said in the manifesto rather than what was it said in the manifesto. And certainly when we were looking into this at the weekend, they wanted uh, some of the comments that were made by Laura Trott of all people back in June when she basically raised the prospect that they could raise NICs on uh, employers mm -hmm. as the sort sort of um, answer to this question, which was actually, no, we were honest, really, with people that this was in scope because we didn't rule it out when Laura Trott first raised it. I think there'll be a lot of people in the public that will look at that and actually think, well, is that really fair? Is that you know, just ruling something out, which, as we know, we spend a lot of uh, general elections asking politicians questions and then they don't answer them and then people write lots of stories about what this means. But I think there will be a question mark about just how um, specific they were about their intentions. And as we've been saying during this process, this is massive. Mm. This isn't a couple of billion pounds <laughs> here or there. This is, I think we were actually going to say, the second biggest ever tax-raising budget in history. I think we um, have discovered that Norman Mons was just a little bit bigger. Um, but it's huge and it is going to have a big impact, as we were saying, on businesses. But also, you know, just in terms of day to day, mm. um, people are going to be looking at it and I think just wondering, you know, whether the government's been straight with them. And that means that people have got to feel better, haven't they? I mean, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves both talked during the campaign and subsequently you've got to feel better off. People have got to feel better off at the end of this parliament. Um, you're right, the billions that are being raised and spent uh, as well, there's got to be some return seen relatively quickly. 
And they've clearly made the call that that should try to be felt in the NHS. And you yes. know, there's lots of polling done that basically if Labour doesn't deliver on the health service, they will struggle to be re-elected. Um, so I think that that's where they're putting that money. You can see that in the figures today. But it means... Um, that basically in other departments, even though we're seeing these massive tax increases and overall increases in spending, there are some departments that are still going to be really hit. Yes. And, you know, in the past few weeks, we've we've seen um, we've done quite a lot of reporting on you know cabinet ministers' concerns about cuts to their departments, yes. and a lot of them are getting investment in the longer term, but in the short term, they're seeing things really really squeeze. And I think we haven't had time yet to really dig into those numbers. But I think when you look at cuts to local government spending, for example to some transport infrastructure projects in the, in the short term um, and also to the justice sector you know all these different things that connect you know you need the courts there's a big backlog mm -hmm. police you need more police officers um, prisons there are no prison places there hasn't been much investment in the in the prison estate so um, all of those things need investment there are big concerns that those are unprotected departments that are not getting more money. I think that's where, you know, in terms you speak about people feeling it. Yes. Actually, how will people feel well, if their local government, if their local council is facing massive, massive cuts? Well, in as you say, there years? is a gamble going on about the NHS that people will feel better if they meet those waiting times of 18 weeks and those waiting lists come down massively. Headlines for tomorrow, if you were writing them, what would uh, be your strap? Well, it probably would be about the gamble. You know, mm. it'll be taxes up, borrowing up, spending up, will it work? Yeah, I think exactly the same, but also the question mark about growth and, and also, you know, it's very clear um, when you look at the OBR report that they're also expecting it to have an impact on inflation, rising to 2.6%. Well, yes, because it goes up, doesn't because it? Because it goes up, exactly. And I think that's something that when you're talking about how people feel it in their mm. pockets, that's not going to help us in terms of our mortgage repayments, which obviously have already taken hit after Liz Truss's mini-budget. And before your headline, just a little bit also about Rachel Reeves, um, Alva uh, Ray, because she obviously lent into the fact she is the first female mm. Chancellor of the Exchequer ever and she it was a commanding performance by her. Yeah, I think so. I thought she looked nervous at the very beginning, mm. kind of understandably, because it's such a big moment. Yeah, but still, I think a, a big milestone that she will really appreciate. She's, you know, she's written books about the history of women in Parliament. She's got a real sense of history. But I still think if I was being punchy writing the front page oh, yes. of a tabloid, I think it would be something like, did we vote for this? Or where's your mandate? I think that that question, just about honesty, right. is a really, really massive one. And just briefly before we go, because we're almost out of time, market reaction. There has been a little bit since Faisal Islam was sitting here. It went down, but I think the market reaction has gone up in terms of bond yields a little bit. But we will bring you that and any other updates, of course, in tomorrow's programme. Politics Live will be back here at 12.15. But from all of us here, thank you to my guests. Bye-bye.